So culturalization, this topic, um, a lot of people know me for one of two things, either for this topic or for my last five years running IGDA at the global scale. Um, this is a topic, this is a, a subject matter that I've been involved with in the game industry for almost 25 years now. So entering the game industry as a geographer and cartographer who worked at Microsoft, and at Microsoft, I created an internal team called Geopolitical Strategy. And my job at the company was to protect them against political and cultural risks in all of their content across all of their products. When the Microsoft Game Studio got started up, I actually started working on all the games and ended up working on pretty much every Microsoft game until I left in 2005. And as a consultant, I've worked on many Microsoft games and partner games ever since. Like even at this very moment, I'm working on the Xbox port of PUBG. So, um, so there's a lot to talk about with this topic, um, and uh, let's just dive into it. So there's a few things I want to address in this topic. I mean, we're going to be talking about culturalization, um, talking about East and West, and kind of the, the general relationship between different cultures. What I also want to talk, though, is, is about, um, okay, oh, idle. Come back, please. There we go. Um, is about world building. So I think all of us are very familiar with a lot of different types of worlds that appear in games, some that are extremely detailed, like Skyrim here, things that could be historically accurate to, to, for the most part, things like Assassin's Creed, which has uh, relies a lot on real world history as the basis for the gameplay. Um, even things like Minecraft, which is literal world building, that is the game. Um, but there is a certain logic to how Minecraft works and a certain set of rules within this world. Um, even games like Limbo and, and other casual games or, or these types of games, these are all realized worlds. They may not be as detailed as something like an RPG like, like uh, Skyrim, but they all are worlds that have been built for a specific purpose. Of course, things like Halo, Again, lots of background and lore that goes into this world. A lot of things that you don't ever see. Um, you might do it in other forms, like in books and other things that they've released or related to the Halo universe. And of course, even Angry Birds, this is a world. It has its rules. It has a narrative. Um, whether or not that narrative is fully realized, like, a, like some kind of huge storytelling RPG, there is a narrative here. There's even, even if it's very basic, if you want to say, well, it's just birds versus pigs, like, well, that is a narrative. Um, and things like GTA, of course, where you have these worlds that are actually like hyper real. Um, so I'm actually from Los Angeles originally, and I love GTA 5 because they did an amazing job of emulating the feeling of LA without actually being LA. So all of these worlds um, also transfer back to um, our real world as well. So if you're a Star Wars fan like I am, um, you go to places like two years ago when I spoke at the console event in Norway, of course I went to Finsa where they filmed The Empire Strikes Back, because why else would you go there? Um, and that's, that's really cool to me. As a fan of Star Wars, the, the fictional universe that was created has, it has also left a footprint on our real world. Or last year when I was in Tunisia, of course I had to go to Lars Homestead, because why else would you go there? Um, earlier this year in Dubrovnik, speaking at the Reboot Conference, a friend of mine and I had to recreate scenes from Game of Thrones. Uh, you may have uh, recognized that as the House of the Undying in Karth, uh, if you're a Game of Thrones fan. Um, so all of these things, there's kind of this interesting relationship between fictional worlds and also the real world, you know, depending on whether or not the real world is used as a setting for these worlds. Now, I'm also a massive geek, just so you know, and this is actually going to be relevant later. So I'm not doing this just to show you how much of a dork I am. Um, but I do cosplay a lot um, because I like to do it. It's also because my daughter there on the right is a costume designer. So we have a lot of fun actually cosplaying together, and she makes all of our costumes. And um, there's a reason I like doing it, um, lots of reasons I like doing it. But I'll come back to this later because it does have some relevance to why these pictures are in the slide deck. Now for me, I've been a gamer ever since this machine showed up. Um, so it's a very long time ago, that's how old I am. So I've always loved games. Um, I never aspired to actually work in the game industry. So like I said, my path in the game industry was actually through geography, um, which was kind of a very strange path, but here I am. Um, for those of us in this generation, having this thing show up was very much like this scene from the movie 2001. And hopefully you've seen this movie. If you haven't, you should see it. 
Um, basically, the obelisk shows up and it basically creates, uh, causes mankind to evolve to a different, higher form. And for those of us of that generation, seeing a, the Pong machine was something we'd never seen before at all. I mean, we, we were playing board games and card games and all of a sudden Pong shows up and our world was changed forever. And so for me, I've been a gamer ever since that time. And obviously, entertainment as we know it, and interactive entertainment has changed ever since then. So in terms of the game industry and where it's going from here, I mean, I'm not going to talk necessarily about the technology and all of that. We all can, we can talk about that for days and weeks. But what I'm talking about is mainly from a perspective of international and of localization. So if you don't know it, basically 50% of the industry's global revenue comes from localized versions of the games. That is a lot of money. A lot of money. A lot of developers I talk to have no idea that that's how much money is made from localized versions. Now, if you look at companies like PricewaterhouseCoopers, they do an annual projection on interactive media and where it's going and how much it's growing. Their projection, which was about a year ago, they say the global industry growth is still almost at 5%, which is pretty good um, for any, any industry. And they're saying within the next three years, we're going to get up to about 90 billion US. Um, I think there's a lot of estimates that actually make that a lot higher. The amazing thing, though, is that a lot of the, that growth, as you might expect, is not going to be coming from traditional markets. It's not going to be coming from North America. It's not going to be coming from Europe. A lot of that's going to be coming from emerging markets like Nigeria, Kenya, India, Vietnam, and elsewhere. Look at these double-digit numbers. I mean, it's amazing to see that projection. Now, granted, a lot of that is going to be mobile because people in these markets, you're, you're not going to be buying a console in India, it's not practical at all. Even having a PC is not that practical in some places. Um, but yet, there's still going to be a, a huge amount of growth. China, of course, is all, also, as we all know, is a massive market. It seems like a lot of us in the industry now are doing pretty much everything we can to be appealing to China. It's not easy to do, which is part of what we're going to be talking here today about. But nonetheless, the growth, even over the next few years, is still going to be very substantial for China. And of course, again, mobile is where a lot of that growth is going to be seen. So you can see how China, which has been known for a very long time now to be a very strong PC gaming market, that's going to be overtaken by mobile very quickly in the next few years. And so, um, so things are changing. Um, now, a lot of people know what localization is. We talk about a lot in the game industry. Basically, localization has been around for decades um, in the software industry, not just games, of course. So you make your software. You want people to be able to, to read it in other cultures, so you translate it. For the most part, that's what localization is. For people who are localization professionals, I'll get into an argument with them about what that really is. But from my experience and my involvement with localization for many years now, it's primarily the translation part. Now, a lot of companies, though, are starting to realize it's not just about translation. It's about designing content that is actually going to work for the culture, not just be legible. The legible part's important, but you have to start thinking about what is actually going to work in these different markets. A lot of times, translating is not good enough. You have to actually think about the game design and think about the overall strategy of what you're creating to see if it might be appealing to other cultures. Now, at some basic level, you're hoping that all human beings are just going to find appeal in that game and just play it. I think there's games that we can point to out there that have that success. I mean, I, honestly, I think Angry Birds is a good example of it. The game mechanic is super easy. You require virtually no localization. All you do is pull your finger and let go. And that's a, that's a game mechanic that is very easy for most human beings to understand. And it helps the game to, be, to have a more universal appeal. Of course, there's a lot of other factors in there about how the game got out there to the world and discovered. But that is one aspect that was really important. So a lot of companies are starting to think more about what do we do beyond just the translation part. Now I'm going to give you an example of the difference between localization and culturalization. I'm going to use Kit Kat bars to, to illustrate. So the top, um, these are basically the exact same product. You can see the top one is actually from Canada because the packaging is in English and French. And then the bottom one is Japanese. As you can see, there's Japanese characters there. So these are essentially the same product, a different wrapper. So that more or less is what localization is. So localization helps makes the concept legible. You can understand that it's strawberry in English, French, and Japanese. Now, one of the things they've done, oh, sorry, that uh, text was a little too big. One of the things they've done in Japan, though, is they've culturalized the Kit Kat in, in a way that no other country has done. And it's a really interesting phenomenon. So you can see 
how what they've done is take the Kit Kat bar and made it a more culturally, culturally relevant experience for the Japanese. So they've actually regionalized the flavors. Like in the North Island of Hokkaido, they have Yubari melon Kit Kats and also baked corn Kit Kats. And that's because people on that island like those flavors more than some of the other uh, flavors out there. And so they, you can see they've made all kinds of flavors of Kit Kats. And you can actually travel around Japan collecting the Kit Kats in different parts of the country. And I have some Japanese colleagues who've admitted that they've done exactly that very thing. They didn't want to admit it, but they said that's what we like to do. Um, and so, you know, that is the kind of underlying part of the Japanese culture, which it is a collector culture. There's a very strong aspect of a lot of Japan's uh, cultural activities and games and whatnot that has a collector aspect to it. That's why something like Pokemon is not a shock at all coming out of Japan. It makes complete cultural sense with, with a lot of the way a lot of the way uh, Japanese people play games and do other activities. So um, this could easily be turned into a game if you want it to be. So that's a little bit of a difference. So they've basically taken Kit Kats and made it a completely unique cultural experience for Japan in a way that doesn't exist anywhere else. Now there's two types of culturalization that I typically have to deal with. The first is reactive culturalization. So this is typically um, finding things or identifying things that's going to be a problem in the game. So this is what, as a consultant, this is usually what I get paid to do. So companies say, we need you to find stuff that's going to be piss people off or have the government ban the game or whatever that might be. It could be a symbol, it could be a gesture, it could be a costume design, it could be something in the story, you name it. It's all kinds of different stuff. So like, for example, in PUBG right now, I'm look, go, running around trying not to get killed, looking at the graffiti on a lot of the walls and a lot of the stuff that's inside the actual buildings uh, around the island. Um, proactive culturalization, though, is where we actually try and take what we know about a culture and see if we can enhance the game in a way that's actually going to make it a better experience for those local players. So for example, when I worked on Forza Motorsports, we had different language versions of the game and we tailored the types of cars you can get by language. So for example, in the Italian version of the game, the default car set was almost all Italian cars. Whereas in the US English version, it was they had a lot of US muscle cars like Mustangs and Corvettes and things like that. Now, of course, you could go online and get the DLC and get any car you wanted, but there was a set, you know, a default set that came with the game. And so we tailored those car sets to the different languages. And that's a form of proactive culturalization so that players are getting something that they generally want to play or want to see. Now, here's, here's a more specific example of reactive culturalization. And you might recognize this. This is the Brahmin from uh, Fallout 3. And this was the mutated Brahmin bull that wandered through the post-apocalyptic Washington, D.C. landscape. And um, this is a big problem for India, because in India, they have laws that protect Brahmin bulls from being harmed. Now, there, that law applies to real Brahmin bulls, not virtual ones. But there was enough concern, because this is a sacred animal in the Hindu faith. They didn't want to take that risk of releasing the game. Now, we went back to Bethesda, and we said, hey, can you guys swap this out for something like my really poorly, poorly, uh, poorly photoshopped two-headed horse? And they said, no, we can't do it. We don't have time to do it. It's not important enough. We don't care if we sell in India, which is really unfortunate because there's the, that's, yes, it's a smaller gaming market, but it's growing very, very fast. And it's one of those ones where if you get a foothold in there, you become like a large AAA title that actually releases in India. That's a really big deal. And players will remember that the next time you release a product because they'll say, look, they, you watched out for us. You released something for us and we really appreciate it. Um, now, another example of, um, for proactive culturalization in the same market in India, Marvel Comics actually partnered with a local uh, comic studio to make this culturalized version of Spider-Man for India. And, um, you know, so at first it was praised a lot because people said, this is a cool idea. Look at they've, they've done this, you know, interesting cultural version of Spider-Man from the waist up. He's pretty much the same, but from the waist down, he has more of a, a folk costume that's traditional in India. But ultimately, this didn't do that well. And the reason it didn't do that well is because when you're dealing with a really famous you know, intellectual property like Spider-Man, what people want is Peter Parker in New York. They want the original. They don't really want this culturalized version. And so this particular experiment didn't work. But I still think it was great that they tried, because they're at least trying to see if there's a market. So it doesn't always work, but sometimes it might. Now, there's three degrees of culturalization that the way I see it. And so, um, so I already mentioned reactive culturalization. 
And then the second one is localization and internationalization. So most people who deal with international issues in games, the step two is what they're more familiar with. So the translation and the internationalization is basically like using like Unicode um, to make sure that all the characters in your game are going to be compatible across different languages. Just simple things like that. Date formats, calendar formats, all that kind of stuff. That's internationalization. Um, so that's what most people are familiar with. So reactive culturalization first. Then you do localization, internationalization, and then you try and do proactive culturalization. And if you want to make this look at it from a more simple standpoint, you first you want your game content to be viable, which means you want it to stay in that market. You don't want the government to ban it. You don't want consumers to get upset at it. And that can happen whether or not your game is translated or not. It doesn't matter, because I've seen games actually get in trouble when they were never even intended to be sold in a specific market. Um, it's just that the game found its way there, either through like the gray or the black market, and the government got notice of it, and they got upset about it. So you still have to be careful. And we'll talk about that point a little bit later. The second thing is to make it legible. So if the game you intend for the game to stay there in that market, then it would be helpful to have the, a language version, um, if that's what people want. Obviously, in some markets, like I know in the Nordic region, there's a lot of players who want to play the original English version. They don't really want a translated version of the game. Whereas in other markets, they strictly want translation. In other mar markets, they don't want translation, but they want subtitles. You know, so they don't want voiceover, but they do want subtitles. So there's all these different methods um, to do the, the localization. And then the third level, which is more tricky, is to try and make the content meaningful. And then again, that's back to proactive culturalization. How do you make your game content meaningful for the players in different markets? Now, some of that, again, is going to come through just the game design by itself. You've made a game that has a universal appeal, and it's going to find its meaning because it kind of resonates at a human level, but that doesn't always work. So, so what we're basically trying to do, we've got game worlds. It's interesting what's happening over there on the right. Um, so you have game worlds that you're building, and you've got local worldviews that you're dealing with, with the different players and consumers and governments out there, and you're trying to combine these things together. That's kind of what I help game uh, companies and developers do. So it's kind of a gene splicing exercise where you're trying to build these, work these things together and end up with culturalized content that actually works in these different markets. This is the tricky part. So this is where I help, where you have this zone where some of the issues are going to be compatible with the, with the local market and some of them will not be. Most of the time, most of the stuff I see in games that I work on, it's compatible. It's not a big deal. We don't have to worry about it. But I'm looking for that little stuff that may not be compatible, which again tends to be more the reactive culturalization part. So that's where my focus tends to lie. So when we're making these decisions, though, the whole culturalization arena, the, the kind of work that I'm doing, brings together a whole bunch of different problems that we're trying to solve at the same time. So first of all, we have to think about what's the high-level goals of the company. Now, th that you can say corporate values or goals and replace that with individual goals. If you're an indie developer, then what's your values? Where do you draw the line? And we're going to address that later too, about freedom of expression. But where do you decide to draw the line on changing something or not? Um, you also have to think about the business strategy. Like if you're a bigger company that does more than just games, like Microsoft, Sony, companies like that, they have to make a decision. What is our goal for the games vertical? We want to, you know, obviously they'll say we want to dominate games. We want the PS4 or the PS whatever to be, you know, the number one console in the world. Um, you think about the market strategy. What are you trying to accomplish in a specific market, in China, for example, or in a region? What do we want to accomplish in East Asia as a company? Um, maybe we're far behind other companies in that region. So what do we have to do um, to, to build up our content? Also, the market strategy for a specific game, like World of Warcraft or whatever it might be that you're, you know, whatever the game is, you also have to think about the specific strategy for that game. And then, of course, there's all the geopolitical and cultural and ethical issues that we're going to talk about, because trust me, I'm getting through all this boring stuff so we can get to the cool examples. Um, there's all, all of those issues that come up as well. So all of these things are going on at the same time. So when I'm having a conversation with a company or with a developer about the potential influence of these culturalization issues or something that I found in their game, we're kind of going through all of this stuff at the same time. Not all of these always apply to the game, but sometimes they do. All of these things and potentially even other issues like keeping shareholders happy if it's a publicly traded company because some companies, they have to worry about that. So um, 
So it's complicated. There's a lot of issues that go around this. It's not just about adapting content. It's also about business strategy for the locale. And that's a huge part of what I do is help companies with their business strategy. Because usually, if you find an issue that has some kind of political or cultural you know, sensitivity with it, it, it usually reflects on the company's values and on their strategy about what they want to do about it. Um, so talking a little bit about world building. So we talk a little bit about, about culturalization and what it is. Now talking, moving into the, a little bit more about world building. So when I'm helping companies and helping developers make worlds, I focus more on the issue of it's about realization, not realism. And I think a lot of times when I talk to devs, at least those who are less experienced, they confuse world building with realism. Like they think Skyrim. To them, Skyrim, that's, that's world building, whereas something like you know, limbo is not. They're all, it's all world building. Even Bejeweled Blitz is a world. There's, there's logic and there's rules and there's things within that world. It may not be as complicated, but nonetheless, there is a set of rules. And so it's about realization over realism. And what I mean by that is you take the narrative goals, even if it's hardly any narrative at all, but there's some kind of narrative there, um, whether it's a casual game or something or something bigger, you combine that with the experience goals, which I mean is what is the game design? What do you want the player to do? What's what are you hoping the player to experience out of that whole, uh, out of the game that you're creating? And you combine the narrative goals with the experience goals, and that actually um, arrives at the realization goals. So that kind of helps guide you on how much of a world do you really need to build. Um, now. There's a quick recipe that I, that I follow for realizing worlds, and we're going to talk about these in more detail um, to some degree. So first, you take a suggestion of familiarity, because you need game, uh, most game players need some kind of reference point. For example, that's why a lot of characters in games, whether they're alien or not, tend to be humanoid. Because if you make a character that tends to be a little blob with no arms or legs, people sometimes have less, you know, less, uh, it's, it's a little bit harder for them to relate to the character. Um, you also have a hint of complex systems, which is really important, especially for, for worlds that tend to be more detailed. Um, a dash of cultural evidence, which I'll also explain. A chunk of logical consistency. And then also a pinch of topology, which is the sense of connectedness between things. And yes, I'm going to describe what, all I, what I mean by all this stuff. So this is kind of the recipe for how you realize a world. So first of all, let's talk about cultural evidence. So what I mean by that is that are, that's objects or things in the environment that suggest that there is culture, that there is something, a presence of a people, presence of a faction, presence of an organization, presence of something, um, rather than just being a brick building, there's something in the room that makes it feel like there is culture. It could be a symbol on the wall. It could be a box on the floor. It could be something in the environment. Um, this is a case, an example, when I worked on Jade Empire um, years ago, you can see these glowing cylinders in the hallway here, and those were supposed to be a form of cultural evidence in the game. Now, what they did in Jade Empire is that this was supposed to be like this quasi-Asian world, but it was supposed to not take place in our world, and yet everything in this world looked like it was from China and Korea and Japan and other cultures. And one of the things that the designers did when they were trying to just kind of fill out the landscape and make it seem cool is they put these cylinders in the walls. And what those cylinders are is actually they are uh, Tibetan Buddhism prayer wheels. So they took something from our world, an artifact, a Tibetan Buddhist prayer wheel, and they stuck it into the environment. And I, we were like, why? <laughs> There's no Tibetan Buddhism in the Jade Empire universe. So why did you put something that's very iconic to one specific faith and you put it in the, in the environment? Now, the reason they're glowing blue is because this was discovered far too late and there wasn't enough time to take it out of the environment. So we said, let's just unskin it, you know, take off the colorful skin like this and let's just make them glow blue. Why not? They're just like these glowy energy cylinders when you walk through the hallway. And that kind of solved the problem. But that, that's an example of creating cultural evidence within the game just to sort of fill out the environment. These things didn't do anything in the game. You just walk past them. They're just something that you see. Um, another important concept, too, and this concept actually comes from geography, is the idea of logical consistency. They also use this term sometimes in, um, in uh, network um, 
network, no, excuse me, that's another thing, never mind. <laughs> so logical consistency, so basically you want logical rules that exist for this environment that apply to the space and time and everything that exists within the world. And so you don't want contradiction. You want, to, you want it to feel like, even if it's a complete fantasy world, if you have something that is so incongruous, like if you're having a, you know, you're playing a Middle Earth based game and someone fi finds an AK-47 in Moria, why? What's the logic? How did they find, why did an AK-47 show up in Moria? I don't care if it's there. I just want to know why though, because otherwise it just seems like a complete glitch and like the game developer really messed up and somebody actually put, put you know, no, that was supposed to be an ax, not, oh, you know, sorry. Um, it'd be kind of cool though. But um, so you don't want to find contradiction in the world system. So there has to be some feeling of logic because when, when players play a world, they're, they're used to dealing with our world here and there is a certain kind of logic to how our world works with the physics even the cultural systems and, and things sometimes it doesn't make sense at all like the politics in my country right now but that's another issue but um also you don't want to lack to you don't you want to have a lack of conflict between the content elements that comprise the world whether it's a real world or fictional world and um, there's also an issue of fidelity of relationships, and, uh, which is a topology, which I'll talk about in a minute. But here's an example of logical consistency. So this, was a, this is from the game Cameo that came out on the original Xbox. And you can see here, um, this is, I worked on this and, and I was approached by an artist and the artist said, somebody said I should talk to you about this. And I said, what's the problem? And they said, well, look, I've, I put these on the side of the road. I'm like, okay, wooden crosses. I said, why are they there? And they said, well, they're supposed to mark grave sites. And I'm like, okay, well, it kind of is like the Jade Empire example. Like, like, there is no Christianity in the Cameo universe. It's completely fictional universe. Why would they put a wooden cross on the side of the road? And so the answer I got back from the artist was, and I quote, what else should I use? <laughs> and I'm just, I try not to be too, uh, you know, indignant about it, but I'm like, you're the creative artist. That's your job. <laughs> You know, figure it out. What would, what would a grave marker look like in this universe? That's your job. And so that also touches upon an issue of being lazy with creativity. And actually that kind of lazy creativity actually is when a lot of issues creep into um, the environment that should not be there. And I'll address that in just a minute. Um, so it's really important to watch that kind of thing. So, you know, but this, this cross is not logically consistent with the universe. It has no reason to be there in the same way like an AK-47 has no reason to be in Middle Earth. Now, topology is also important next to logical consistency. They kind of go hand in hand because topology, it's, as opposed to the term topography, which is mainly about differences in elevation over a surface, topology is about how things connect to one, other, one another. Topology doesn't care about the distance between them, like you know how many meters or kilometers. All it cares about is the relationship between this thing and that thing. And so it gives a sense of connectedness to larger things or to other things that might be in the universe. Um, so why and how things are related, not specifically where, it's, where it is, when it is, who it is. Um, it applies to pretty much anything. It could apply to ideas that are brought up in the game. It could apply to a symbol, an object in the game. It could apply to different characters. Um, it helps convey a sense of a much broader universe. And so, um, it, it, without actually building that universe, so sometimes to, to create a sense of topology, a, a sense of larger universe, all you have to do is mention it one place in the game or have one object that kind of hints that there's like some other massive culture out there that you might not even see. Like in the original Halo games, which I worked on, I thought they did a nice job of mentioning the Forerunner um, race, but they didn't really go into it very deeply. They did in later games, but initially they just kind of hinted at it and you're seeing all this amazing architecture and stuff, but they didn't really explore what's going on with it. So you're just kind of getting a sense that there's a lot more to it. If you saw Rogue One, I thought they did a really nice job with um, a sense of topology because for those of us who are just rabid Star Wars geeks, um, you know, Chirrut Imwe, this character, they said he's a guardian of the wills. Now that term wills has been dropped in the Star Wars lore since the original movie came out when I was 12 years old. So those of us who are geeks, we've heard that term for decades. And then finally in this movie, they drop it in the, in the movie itself and we're like, <gasps> they finally mentioned that term. It actually, may, it actually means something within the Star Wars universe, but they didn't even go into it in this movie. They just happened to drop that one line. Or then when you see the flyover and you see like this, uh, 
this hill or mountain range that is actually a fallen statue of a Jedi, it's like, wow, what the hell happened here? I want, you know, but you don't need to know. You don't have to go into more detail. Just the fact that it's there suggests that there was something that happened here or some other history that you haven't seen, and you may not see it in this story, but maybe you'll see it some other time. Um, but that kind of sense, sometimes with fans, sends a chill down their spine because they're like, wow, that's cool. That's something I, I want to know more about it. But you just kind of like, nope, it's just there, kind of like, a, just, I just want to suggest that there's more to this place than you could possibly know. But uh, of course, well, that particular planet, Jeddah, doesn't exist anymore. So um, anyway, core steps to world building. So there's three main steps that you take. You set the context, basically you have to decide whether or not it's more or less going to be real world based or fictional world based. Um, you determine the level of complexity, the degree of realization, which again goes back to your narrative goals and experience goals. And then you also talk about creating with intent. So you build out the world's layers and I'm going to address these a little bit more as we talk deeper into culturalization. So the real world fictional world thing is just it's obvious that we all know it's not black and white. It's not either or. I mean, games are so much of a spectrum between the two. There's a broad zone of overlap. You've got some, like I mentioned, that are complete fictional worlds that I've already mentioned. You've got stuff like GTA, which is somewhere in the middle here, where it's what I like to call hyper real. It's very, it feels very much like a real place, and yet it isn't. Um, because they've just happened to model after a real place. So there is no... Um, there is no dichotomy here that, that's black and white, but it is important when we're thinking about world building, this does influence our decision making about what goes in the game and about what level of freedom we have to have, uh, you know, basic creative freedom. If you're going to deal with strictly real world, like if you're going to create a historical scenario, then you probably want to be pretty damn accurate, not, not have a lot of leeway with what actually happened. You're probably going to want to recreate the landscape pretty exactly. You're going to want the time, you know, the time scale and the events to go pretty exact. Um, like I worked on all the Age of Empires game. They tried to kind of be here, but they weren't because they're highly generalized. So they're kind of a little bit over a bit because um, they're they do take place in the real world but they're very highly generalized because you just can't in those games you can't recreate every single detail of those battles that took place now about creating complexity with the cultural evidence so going back to the cultural evidence part so what i always try and recommend to developers is to use the most minimal amount of content to convey the presence of in-game culture so you don't want to overdo it necessarily um, unless you want to i mean it's your creative choice but usually you don't need to you know you say well i want to convey that there's a certain kind of culture in my game there's these kind these characters from this faction or from this planet or whatever they are um, okay, great. Well, what you can decide, what is it going to be that conveys their culture? The, maybe it's just their uniform and nothing else. Maybe it's their uniform and their ship or their vehicle. Maybe it's like you're going to get a glimpse of what their cities are like or what their politics are like and all that other stuff. You basically have to kind of decide what, how deep do you need to go. Um, what is the, but focus on the most minimal amount because I've seen a lot of developers who go to crazy links to flesh out what this what this culture is or what this world is and yet what actually ends up in the game is a tiny little slice. Now for some creators that's important to them because like look at Tolkien for example. Tolkien went to tremendous lengths to flesh out his world and yet in his books we get a we get a pretty sizable slice. But we as we know from all of his his the amount of his writings, there's still a whole much, a lot more that he thought about, about Middle Earth that never got into a written form. Um, so it just depends what, what you need to decide how much content you need to flesh out that culture. Again, applying logical consistency. Um, we talked about that, using only what makes sense for your universe. And the highest risk activity that I deal with when I, when I work on games, no matter what it is, is what I call backfilling the game. And so what I mean by that what typically happens is I, I will start with a project at the beginning um, because I, I talk with the, the artists and the writers, the producers. I get a sense for what's, what is this world they're building. Um, I can kind of give them little course corrections saying that's not going to work in that region or that's not going to work there. Um, or why don't we try this instead? Because if you really want to focus on that region, then you might want to add this to it instead. So that's the kind of thing that I help them with. But then once, once the idea is set in stone and people just start working on it, all, everyone does their job, 
that's typically where it becomes really dangerous because it kind of goes back to that, that cameo example with the wooden cross. The artist is just doing his job and he's just going down the checklist of all the things that he needs to make on a daily basis. And usually if he's working in a larger company, especially in the US, he's probably crunching, which shouldn't be. And, um, you know, so it's like, I need to get all this shit done within, you know, the day. I have to create 30 different objects. So I'm just going to boom, 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 and create as much as I can. And it gets, you can get sloppy and you can get lazy that way. If they say, I need a character, like, okay, I'll pull this stereotype off my mental shelf and just plug in the stereotype. Um, and they don't really think about it. And so it's, it's a dangerous activity that can lead to a lot of potential issues. And honestly, in a lot of the stuff that I have found over my years of doing this work, a lot of it is it came out of that phase of the content development. It wasn't at the early stage, the conceptual stage, and it wasn't really at the end. It was stuff that happened in that middle part where everyone's just heads down creating, creating, creating. And so, but the, the key though, about creating that evidence is that um, number one is don't be lazy about it, which I already mentioned. You have to create with a purpose. It's super important. And I, I see far too many people who just create kind of like blindly just, I'll just create it. And a lot of it because it's under time pressure. Um, but I think this is one of those areas where there is a huge difference, of course, between like massive AAA style development versus indie development. Yeah, I'm not saying indies don't have pressure too. They absolutely do, but you're in a little more control of your pressure. Um, you know, it's a, or it's a different kind of pressure. Let's put it that way. Like, will I, ha will I have money to eat by the end of the week? And I get it. So I'm a consultant. I understand that too. So, um, but you still have to think about why is this in the game? What, what is this for? Am I just you know, ticking a box or am I actually creating it for a specific reason? And if, it, I, if I don't have a specific reason, then why am I spending my time on it? The other thing too is to make sure you ask the hard challenging questions, especially of each other. And this, I know this is really tough to do. A lot of developers, especially if you're on a team, no matter what the size of the team, you, you, you kind of, you admire each other's work and their skill and your, their expertise. And you want to just let them just do it. It's like, yeah, whatever. You created a symbol for that group. That's cool, whatever. But at some point, somebody has to ask the question, where did you get that idea from? Or what is that supposed to mean? Or I, I think I may have seen that somewhere else. Or did you research that and find out if that actually means something? And um, because you never know where it's going to come from. I mean, for example, when I've, I've worked on all the Bioware games for the last 12 years, and when I was working on Dragon Age, one of the artists did a conceptual art of this one character, and on his forehead, in the conceptual art, was a, the symbol of the Sikh faith, almost exactly. And so I called it out to him, and I said, why is it on his forehead? And he's like, what are you talking about? I said, that symbol, that's, that's the symbol of the Sikh faith. And he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, okay, well, the, this can't be a coincidence. And so, and as it turns out, this is one of those areas where um, now in the U.S. in particular, a lot of Sikhs, what they do is they'll put their symbol on the back of their car window. They just want to do it just like a lot of people in the U.S. do. They'll put a cross, they'll put whatever on their car, you know. And so my, th my thinking is that he probably just saw that symbol. It lodged in his, in his mental, you know, capacity. And as, during the creative process, he just out it came. And, um, and he just subconsciously dropped the symbol back into, uh, into the art. That happens. It's not unrealistic. Um, it just was weird to me that it was like exact and he had no idea what the symbol was. Um, or it's just dumb luck. It could have been either one. But, um, but that's a case where somebody, like in, my, in that particular example, it was my job to ask him the question, what, what is that symbol? And fortunately, I knew what it was. But someone else on his team could have asked the same question. It's like, what is that symbol? Or do you have any idea where that came from? Or did you do any research on it and find out what it is? And I think it's important to ask those questions. You're not challenging their creative expertise. You're, you're, just, you're just asking about their choice, okay? You're not saying you're a bad artist or a bad writer or whatever. You're just saying, I would just, I'm curious about that particular choice and whether or not it actually fits within the universe we're making. Now, in terms of the layer idea, um, now geographers, this is kind of where the geographer side comes in. You know, we're really good at realizing worlds because we spend all of our time basically deconstructing this one. 
um, that's basically what we do. And the way we think about this particular world is we think about it in thematic layers. Um, cartography basically is about world rebuilding. As a cartographer, that's exactly what I did. I would take this world and I would select items th from this world and I would recreate it in map form and that was my job. And it was my decision making about what actually goes on the map. A lot of people think a map is completely objective. Of course it isn't. It's not objective at all. It's a cartographer making decisions about what should or should not appear on the map. Um, now, the cart most cartographers, we are committed to showing what we call ground truth because we want to represent the real world as best as we can in map form. Um, but that doesn't always happen. Sometimes you're being requested to make a map by a government agency. You're being asked to make a map by a certain company. Um, you know, that's where the whole propaganda angle comes in. That's where uh, misinformation comes in. Um, and of course, maps aren't the only culprit, but it happens. But the point here is that the way we look at the world when it comes to deconstructing our world is we, to make it easier because our world is so ridiculously complex, we look at it in terms of layers like this. And so that's kind of how our brains work when we look at the world. We're looking like a climate layer, population layer, culture layer, language layer, all of these different things. And that kind of helps us kind of deconstruct how our world is, is, uh, is uh, built. And so um, when we look at it that way, when we're building a game, a lot of times we approach it from the same angle, although I haven't seen a lot of developers actually explicitly look at it from that angle in terms of layers, but basically what they're doing, you know, there's all kinds of potential layers that you can use to build a game world. And some of these you might need, and for some games, like even some casual games, you might need hardly any of these because they're not relevant to what you're building. But I mean, this list, if you wanted to, to make a detailed list, can go down to the center of the earth. I mean, there's just so many different variables that you could define. Um, you take any one of these things and it could be more and more complicated. So, so you, you think about the different things that are used in, in any particular game. Um, and so the layers are really important to, to consider. Now, I want to focus on, from a cult culturalization standpoint, the five major cultural layers that we often deal with in games. These are the five areas that most typically are problematic from a culturalization standpoint. And they're also the areas where most typically companies might try and use these as a way to make the games more appealing. So these are both um, useful for reactive culturalization. So this is where mo normally most of the problems happen. And most of the examples will be reactive culturalization examples. Um, but there are also areas where a lot of companies might try and actually do proactive culturalization and see if they can add something in the game among these layers that actually makes it more appealing. So as you might guess, um, these layers, which we'll talk about each one in more detail, but history, faith, inclusion versus exclusion, which I'll explain, intercultural dissonance, and geopolitical imaginations. So the first one about history, um, one of the things we have to remember, especially this applies to people in North America, is because relatively young, quote, cultures, um, is historical memory is extremely persistent. And this is particularly true in older cultures like you'll find in Asia, um, East Asia in particular, China, Korea, Japan, India, um, all of these countries. is like you're dealing with cultures that have been around for many, many decades, or decades, excuse me, centuries, if not millennia. And they have a lot of history behind them. So you have to be very careful about how you approach their history. So here's an example. When um, Age of Empires, wow, this is 20 years ago now, Age of Empires was being released in Korea. And so you can see here what this map shows is the original scenario that we put into the game. And this is what history tells us really happened. So what this shows you is the Yamatos here in Japan, this is Japan here, they invaded the Korean Peninsula and they basically took over the Chozon Empire. That's what history says happened. And um, so we released the game in Korea and the Korean Minister, Ministry of Information said that never happened. And we're like, okay, so um, what are we supposed to do? So we can't release the game in Korea because of this, quote, error in our game. And so, as you might imagine, this led to quite an ethical debate uh, among the team. I mean, we're talking about arguments around what is truth with a capital T. You know, what is truth? What is meaning? What is history? 
um, all of these topics we were debating because what are we supposed to do about this? You know, part of this then goes back to that chart I mentioned earlier about business strategy and market strategy and all that. So part of what was feeding our decision making on this particular issue is we had to, we did market research and we showed that RTS games, real time strategy games like Age of Empires, were very popular in Korea. Now, if you know the history of the Korean market, a year later is when StarCraft came out and StarCraft became a national phenomenon in Korea, and it still is a national phenomenon in Korea. And so we knew that RTS games, we really should make sure we can release this RTS game in Korea. So in that case, that was one of our, we, and plus Microsoft was at the beginning of its games business at the time, so we wanted to grow the games business, we needed to get into Korea, this particular game type was important. So we eventually made the decision to create a patch that was only applicable to the Korean players that changed history. So working with the Korean Ministry of Information, you can see what happened is that the Chozon actually invaded Japan and then were repelled by the Japanese. So it's quite a change, quite a significant change. Now, again, some people on the team were really upset about this. I had to remind them a few years earlier, I worked on Encarta Encyclopedia at Microsoft and we had for the, for the French and Italian versions of the encyclopedia, we had different heights for Mont Blanc. Okay, because the governments did not agree on the exact height of the mountain. So how is that different? That's a physical fact that is different in an encyclopedia. And this is a scenario in a game that has been changed. And so what this starts addressing is that issue of, of um, how you address as a content developer, whether it's a game or encyclopedia or whatever it might be, how do you address local expectation? And that's kind of where this is going. And so that was a lesson learned 20 years ago that started changing thing, the way we, things worked at Microsoft, um, and this this is the incident that actually led me to create a proposal to create the geopolitical team that I eventually created about six months after this happened. Um, more recent history can also be sensitive, so not just distant history, but like this game was developed to recreate the Battle of Fallujah in Iraq in 2004, and this actually got a lot of backlash in the US before it released because a lot of people were saying, especially at the time they were gonna release it, they said, we're still fighting this. We're st we still have troops in Afghanistan and Iraq, and we don't wanna see this played as a, as a game, especially because it was meant to be like super realistic. And so there was so much pressure that the publisher Konami eventually said, we're not not going to release this game and they didn't and the game this game still never released even though it was pretty much all finished and so sometimes it could be something that's very recent in history that is considered too sensitive you know it's too soon of course now you know we're what we're uh, 13 years past that event would this game be acceptable to release now I would say probably I, th I think the climate's changed dramatically even in the last you know five or six years um, so I don't think it'd be mu as much of a big deal right now and then faith, of course. So dealing with cultures that maintain expectations that, are, that originate in religious beliefs. This is a very serious issue that I, we deal with all the time across different games. Um, sometimes it's something simple like this. So in Resistance Fall of Man, they use the, uh, this is the cathedral of, uh, in Manchester, um, UK. Um, and it's from the Church of England. It's the Church of England's cathedral. And so the game developers, what they did is they recreated the cathedral perfectly. They did a beautiful job, but what they did is they took the fighting into the church and they destroyed part of the church. And the Church of England was not happy about it. And so they asked the developers, you need to take our church out. Well, the game was already on the shelf. It's already released. It's not going to happen. So they had a negotiation with Sony and they kind of settled their differences. But what the church ended up doing is creating what they call sacred digital guidelines, which means that now if you want to use any Church of England facility in any kind of media, you have to get their approval. So you have to show them what you're going to do to their buildings and all that kind of stuff, which basically means you're not going to be able to use their buildings. So... Um, Interestingly enough, Hitman 2 did almost the exact same thing. They got backlash for it because they took the fighting into the Golden Temple in Amritsar, India, which is the center of the Sikh faith. And so not only did they put the setting in that most sacred spot, but they also had the, whatever he is, antagonist, protagonist, killing Sikhs inside their most sacred temple. Probably not a good idea. Um, and so they got backlash for this as well. Um, sometimes it's something simple like this. A lot of, if you've noticed, especially if you're a manga or anime fan, um, a lot of Japanese manga and anime tend to, not just Japanese, but primarily, what they tend to do, you probably notice this crucifix on this character. This was in the game Blaz Blue, 
And this crucifix, which an upside down crucifix is in the West is an occultic symbol. Um, there was really kind of no real good reason for that to be there. Um, they just kind of threw it on there. And I've seen that in so many games. I've worked on a lot of Japanese RPGs that were meant to come over to the West. And there were just all kind of use of the Star David, use of the crucifix in all kinds of bizarre ways because it's just they don't have the cultural context for those symbols. And so they just kind of just use them because they know in the West they see those symbols everywhere and they're, they are everywhere. So we'll, we'll just we'll put crosses on stuff because people will like it. Um, but it just doesn't work that way necessarily. Um, now, of course, this character looks like she's, she's supposed to be kind of occultic anyway, so maybe that was sort of the intent. But when we talked it through with them, they're like, it doesn't really have any reason to be there. Um, or things like this you might have heard with Smite. Smite got a lot of backlash because what they did, if you haven't played this game, it basically has these pantheon of different gods, like the Nordic gods and the Egyptian gods. Well, what they did is they also added the Hindu gods into that mix. And without thinking that the Hindu gods are worshipped by about a billion people on this planet right now. So, you know, you, but they're equating what is seen as sort of antiquated old world gods like the Egyptian and Nordic gods, even though, yes, I know there's people who worship them, but very small minority groups of them. Um, but they threw them together with the Hindu gods. And so a lot, of, a lot of people were very upset about this. A lot of people from India, a lot of people from the Hindu faith, because they're like, why, why did you do this? It's like, you might as well throw Jesus and Muhammad in there too. Why, you know, why leave them out? Um, so, um, and then again, back to Jade Empire, it's using, this is also related to Hinduism, um, basically where they created this elephant demon and the original, this was what the elephant demon ended up looking like. This is the final version. But in the original versions of it, it looked much more like Ganesha, which is a very benevolent, uh, friendly god from the Hindu faith. And so they basically took this very positive symbol from Hinduism and turned it into this quite evil uh, elephant demon that you had to fight in Jade Empire. Because um, originally it did have four arms and it had like more ornate um, headdress and everything. So we kind of kind of stripped it down a bit. Um, to kind of basically separate it, kind of add more distance between the original inspiration and what actually showed up in the game. And then this character, if you've played Halo, um, you know about this character. If you have not played Halo, I have to give you the brief synopsis really quick um, because this is complicated. So Halo, you've got Master Chief, the main and main protagonist he's basically a u.s archetype soldier i don't care if it says un on his shoulder he has american accent he has american soldiers with him um, he's the main protagonist the super soldier um, trying to protect earth and all the humans you've got the covenant which is the alien a group of alien races they're different alien races that are banded together they're quasi-religious because they worship the halo rings there's seven of them in the galaxy and their mission is to turn on the halo rings and destroy all sentient life in the galaxy. The covenant is run by three leaders, each of whom is called a prophet. Now, one of them is called the prophet of truth. That's an often used synonym for Muhammad. Now that I let go because you could use that for a lot of religious figures, prophet of truth, it's somewhat generic. What I did not let go was the term dervish because dervish is very specific to the sect of Sufi Islam. It's a very specific title in the much the same way that Pope is very specific to Roman Catholicism. So I said, if you have the prophet of truth is commanding the dervish to attack the humans and turn on, basically commit genocide across the galaxy and, okay, so that's the game scenario, and you've got this U.S. super soldier trying to stop him, and this is one of the first major titles Microsoft is releasing after 9-11. So I felt that this was setting up an allegory that was going to be way too obvious that basically Microsoft's response in a, in a not so subtle way is to release a game that shows their most famous game character, the Master Chief, is going to destroy Islam. And I'm like, I don't like this idea. I don't think this is positive. I, don't th I think it's too easy to read that into it. And I actually did some testing with people who I know from different uh, markets in the Middle East. People, I just kind of fed them the idea and said, what, what do you see here? They said, well, it seems like we're being attacked. <laughs> I'm like, okay, that's all I need to know. Um, 
So my solution, this is a very surgical solution. I said, all you need to do, there's nothing else in this game that's a problem. The only thing I recommend is to change dervish because that is the hinge. That's a very specific term to Sufi Islam. If you change it to something else, you can leave Prophet of Truth and leave everything else. You, that just kind of, again, distances from the potential for allegory. And so we, d we eventually had that done. And as you, you see, if you've played the games, that's why the character is called the Arbiter, which I frankly think is a much better name for the character anyway. But it took about eight or nine months to make that decision because there was resistance. Um, and I won't go into that. But anyway, um, it did get changed. And so fortunately, we kind of avoided the, that potential allegory. Um, or it's something super simple like this. So when this game came out last year, if you haven't played this game, basically when, when you win a fight, the, 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 the uh, fighter, this is a real fighter, he really, you know, he really competes in UFC, um, they have, the, they have the, the characters, they'll do like generic actions when they win, like pump their fists, walk around and strut. Well, one of the generic actions is doing this, doing, forming the, ca the cross like a Catholic does. This guy is a Muslim. And so this guy, this Muslim character was forming the cross and he took notice of it. And he's like, what, what, I don't understand this. What, I converted inside the game? What happened? <laughs> so, um, and it's just little simple things like that. Just little things. Somebody, all they had to do was check and see that this particular guy, this particular real guy is a Muslim and just say, just make sure that one particular generic action does not happen with this character. That's all they had to do. And they did not do that. Um, now, these games are interesting because I, I did work on this one on the left, um, you know, on the original Xbox. And so what happened in both of these games is that the games used a one audio file that had chanting from the Quran in the game. And so um, in the one on the left, the problem was that it was discovered very, very late. I mean, the game was already packaged and literally on trucks going to the stores when it was discovered. So to their credit, when, when we flagged it, we said, OK, we need to fix this. Like, we'll fix it right away. So all the, all the subsequent copies will all be fixed. I'm like, great, perfect. So what about the 75,000 units that are on trucks right now going to stores? Well, we'll just, so what? So we'll just release those in the US. That's not a big deal. I'm like, really? I mean, do you know there's like 8 million Muslims in the United States? Did you know the city of Detroit's like 50% Muslim? It's like, there's, we're not a homogeneous society in the US. It's kind of like the whole point of it. Um, so I'm, as a geographer, I'm trying to quote statistics to them. They're like, ah, oh, don't worry about it. And sure enough, three months later, we get a letter from this government of Saudi Arabia where the game was never intended to be sold. But the game found its way to Saudi Arabia and found its way to the government. And they basically sent a letter telling Microsoft, you need to, you need to stop this. You know, they addressed it to Bill Gates, as they always do, dear Mr. Gates, because he was still the CEO at the time. And it became a huge debacle. So it became front page news in the Middle East. Um, it started getting more and more negative attention across the region um, because, you know, it's like, as, as you know, things they catch fire like that. People are like, look, Microsoft hates Muslims and Microsoft disrespects us. And especially one of the things is that when Saudi Arabia makes that call, it's the center of this faith. And as things go throughout the Muslim world, if Saudi Arabia takes an action, the other countries tend to follow with Saudi Arabia's lead. And so this was a really bad scenario for us. So I actually ended up having to go to Saudi Arabia and other countries in the Middle East to do damage control when this was unraveling. And it also was unraveling a week before the second Gulf War started. So that was interesting too. But, um, but needless to say, it, it, we did fix it um, by pulling the game off the market forever. So can you imagine working on this game for about two years and because some moron on your team did not check and see what that audio was because when we asked the developer, why did you put this in there? They said, it sounds cool. It's like, did you not check the source? Did you not check that what the lyrics were saying? And they didn't, they didn't know. And so I'm like, there's no excuse for that. But the game got taken off the market forever because it was too controversial. So imagine having that happen to a game that you're working on, you'd probably be pretty pissed off. Um, when Sony released Little Big Planet, they had a somewhat similar issue happen with an audio file. Um, they, they caught it before release, though, and they actually stopped the game before releasing. So it d was delayed for three weeks so they could fix it. And um, so basically, they, they, uh, they did fix it, um, but they also told the public why they're re not releasing the game on time. 
and people were still very pissed off at them. Say, how could you be so stupid? How could you not know that this was, you know, this was lyrics from the Quran? So there was kind of a no-win scenario. But of course, this game did go on to be successful because at least they tried. They tried to, to do the right thing. And of course, as we know, this, this can become a very big issue. It's become a big issue in other media, like the cartoons in Denmark you know, several years ago. This stuff has real-world consequences. Um, and some people ask, you know, why is this important? It's the Middle East. Who do we, why do we care about the Middle East region when it comes to gameplay? Well, take a look. As of earlier this year, you probably can't read this very well. This is Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Iran, UAE, Qatar, Israel, Kuwait, Oman, Iraq, Lebanon. These are revenue in millions of dollars. That's almost 800 million in gaming revenue in Turkey. In Saudi Arabia, where a lot of people assume, well, they're conservative, they don't play games. 650 million US in gaming revenue. That's not insignificant. So the Middle East is a massive gaming market. And so this does matter. This does matter to, and this, this is a very fast growing market, very similar to those numbers I showed earlier about the double, double digit growth in emerging markets. The Middle East is, is not far off of that. So this is just, that's one of the reasons why this is important. Now, inclusion versus exclusion. This one is interesting because it's a very broad category. Um, it's basically when people perceive that they're being treated unfairly, in inequitable treatment because of their culture, their gender, their nationality, um, whatever it might be, their ethnicity. There's all kinds of reason why they might feel like they're being excluded. Um, and so if you look at things like this, like Resident Evil 5, right before the game came out, um, you could, they release these images showing this white protagonist going around a sub-Saharan African village gunning down African villagers. And now the developer said, what's the big deal? Look, they're zombies. So what, why is this a big deal? Now, this is where the cultural context in which that game is being created is so important. Because one of the things we have to remember here is that this game was created primarily in Japan. Japan is 98% ethnic Japanese. There's, diversity is not a really big concept in Japan. In fact, back in the late 90s when I was at Microsoft, I actually had to fly to Tokyo and do presentations in, some, in Japan and some of the other Asian uh, Microsoft offices to basically tell them what diversity is from the Western perspective. Because that was back in the 90s is when it was really becoming much more of a thing in a lot of our content that we need to account for diversity. And so um, one of the things that they don't have in that cultural context, especially like we do in the US where racial issues are still very volatile, um, is like these notions of like the great white hunter and the dark continent, these ideas that were very prevalent 100 years ago. Um, but these are still very strong themes today that are considered very offensive. And so that having that imagery, they didn't really understand the sensitivity of that imagery, but now they do. Um, now, some people got really angry at them, but I, I'll, and I'm not saying we shouldn't be angry. I'm just saying we also have to just remember the cultural context in which it was created. So sometimes there's a reason why it did not show up the way you might expect. This game, if you have not played Pocket God, um, as the name implies, basically you torture these people. Um, these are indigenous people. Now, one of, the, one of the things that makes this problematic is that just the depiction of an indigenous person alone is problematic. You see the sharp little teeth, the the uh, grass skirt, the bone in, the hair, bone in their hair, that's a very like Victorian era uh, depiction of an of a indigenous person. And it's considered very offensive by a lot of people. Um, but as you play this game, you can make things happen like the ants come out and eat them or the volcano explodes and you melt them. And um, you know that's just what you do. And you dangle them over sharks and you, you feed them to sharks and stuff. Now what's interesting though is the developer said that these are not, this is not a specific culture. Don't worry about it. We're not trying to offend anyone. It's like, really? So what is this? This is, this is a Moai. A Moai exists in one place on Earth, Easter Island. So you've instantly made this the Eastern Island culture. So don't try and tell me that it's not supposed to be any particular culture because you used a cultural artifact that instantly makes it a specific culture. And so that was not a good excuse. And so in the later version of the game, which this screen is from, you can see they changed it to something else so that they made up their own little generic idol. But um, you know, you have to be extremely careful with that kind of stuff. I mean, it's one thing to, to, to depict an indigenous person that way. It's a whole other thing than to actually make, you know, basically say that the people of Easter Island look like this and they deserve to be burned and eaten. Um, 
In other fields, like this is an example that came from retail several years ago when Abercrombie and Fitch decided to leverage some of these stereotypes, the imagery of Asian people, um, you know, which a lot of Asian folks consider to be extremely offensive. You know, again, the use of stereotypes, it's, it's, it's really problematic. And we've seen it in games, you know, the use of gender stereotypes, racial stereotypes, you know, all orientation stereotypes, all kinds of things. Just like I was working on one Japanese RPG where they were super proud that they included a gay character in the game. But the way that gay character acted and sounded was so ridiculous. It was so over the top and so flamboyant. And so they're like, but we, we added the character in the game. It's like, yeah, but the way you did it is just basically a caricature. It's a stereotype. It's, it's actually really offensive um, because the way you added it in the, in, the, in the game, it's basically like you're making fun of that particular person. Um, or, of course, things like this with Lara Croft. Well, I think this is actually a good example because now Lara used to be one of the, the poster children of sexism in games with the way she was depicted in some of the early versions. But now the later versions after the reboot have actually gotten a lot of praise, not just because of the way she looks more normal, but also the emotional depth that she was given as a character, which is in, in a lot of that is thanks to people like Rihanna Pratchett, who did the writing. Um, she's an amazing writer, and so she added a lot of emotional depth to this character that just wasn't there in some of the earlier games. And so I find it fascinating how she, this particular character has evolved over the years into being actually a more one of the better examples of having um, women in game. Intercultural dissonance is a, is a really interesting one because it's this kind of tension that exists between cultures or nationalities for all kinds of reasons. It could be for historical reasons. It could be for a number of other strange reasons. Um, we're going to go back to Age of Empires because uh, I like it so much and go back to Korea because it's a great example. So can anyone tell me why this particular artwork would be a problem in Korea? Any guesses at all? What's that? Yes, the samurai. But here's, here's the real question, is if you can tell me why it was a problem in 1999. And for the sake of time, I'll tell you. So the samurai is correct. They, they were, they, the Korean retailers had a problem with having a samurai on the box. The reason is not just because they don't like Japanese. The reason is because in 1999, Japan and Korea were at a height of tension over a disputed area in the middle of the Sea of Japan. Now, Korea calls the Sea of Japan the East Sea, and in the middle of this Sea of Japan slash East Sea, there's a the couple of little rocks. They're called Dokdo in Korean. They're called Takashima in Japanese. They're actually occupied by the Koreans. And so the two countries are at this huge peak of tension over this dispute. And so during that time, and I did not mean to show this yet, during that time, um, Korean retailers were saying, we're not going to put anything on our shelves that shows Japan. We're, we're, we're sick of Japan. We're pissed off at Japan over this dispute. So we're not going to put anything that shows Japan. Now, this game, this, this game is like basically caught in the crossfire of a cultural war, of a geopolitical issue. And so the game had nothing to do with it itself. It wasn't the game content. It just happened to be that it just, they just happened to choose a samurai to put on the box. And it happened to come out at a time that was really difficult. Um, for this particular issue. And so a, a, a little bit later when the expansion pack came out, you can see most of the world saw this version with Montezuma on the art on the box art. Well, Korea got to see this version, which had a Korean general front and center, and that was to sort of make up for this problem. So they said, no, we actually love you, Korean players. Please play our game. We're actually going to put a Korean general on it. See, we love you. Um, this stuff still happens, though, because just a few years ago, um, there's a disputed island off of Taiwan called, da, called uh, Dayu Islands in Chinese, or the Senkaku Islands in Japanese, and China and Japan got at a height of the tension over that dispute. And so in China, Japanese goods during one month a few years ago saw over a 50% drop because Chinese consumers said, We're, we refuse to buy Japanese because of this dispute. You know, the Honda, Sony, Toyota, all of these brands saw massive sales drops because of consumer pressure. And so this stuff can have a real effect. And so that's one of the things I actually help developers do when I work on a project. I'm, I'm not just looking at the content itself. I'm looking at the context of where the product's going now. So when the, if they tell me this game's going to come out in, say, July of next year, I'm already looking ahead to kind of see what the geopolitical or cultural environment might be like in that time frame. 
Um, one of the things that's also very uh, sensitive between different cultures is gestures. So you can see here a couple of examples, like this one that she's doing. I think a lot of people know this is rock on. If you, you know, most, I think universally they see that's like the rock on gesture. Um, if you're from the state of Texas in the US, that means hook em horns, because the University of Texas, they all do this for like a bull horns. Um, if you're in Italy, it means I'm sleeping with your wife. And um, there's all kinds of meanings, you know, the, this, this symbol, of course, we all know what this is. And in the, in the British Commonwealth, they do it this way instead. You know, this is the same thing. This is the same thing. Um, doing this symbol. So like in Dance Central, when I was working on these games, in the early build of the, of the original game, every single dance move ended at the end of the song like this, with the hands splayed open like this. Well, that symbol in Greece is the matza. The, the matza like this is the same as this. So imagine dance, 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 you end, you know, like that. <laughs> and it's probably not a good player experience. So, you know, then we we're like, okay, they're like, well, okay, we won't do this, we'll do this instead, pointing. I said, you, you can't point, because in East Asia, it's very rude to point at people. So I said, don't have them pointing either. Like, well, what are we supposed to do? I said, just have them make a fist. You're good. They said, well, isn't a fist problematic? Isn't like that, that's like the, the power fist, you know, uh, social justice. Like, no, that's up here, not here. Okay, it's a difference. It makes a difference. So, um, or like what he's doing, that's kind of the, the other version, the French version, you know, we do this. It's not quite, he's not quite doing it because he's not connecting behind his elbow, but it's close. And if you're not watching closely, some parent might say, you know, oh my God, how is that in that game? Um, whether or not we care about what the parent says, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but yeah, gestures, very, very culturally specific. That's why I worked on all these games, because I was looking for hand gestures and body language that could be offensive in different cultures. And just make sure, you know, a lot of times I'm not trying to like, if, the, if there's a really, really good reason for having that in there, then we'll keep it in there. Like we're, this, we're not going to take this out. We know what it means in Italy, but still, this is such a universal gesture in the context of rock and roll music, we're not going to take it out. Other things like this, this is not a game example, but what's interesting about this is that, so this, I wanted to give it as an example of how subtle these things can be, and don't, you can't even see it over there, so look at this version here. Um, you can see here what this was, is this was, the, this was the default desktop image for a version of Windows that was being created for the Indonesian government, okay? And so, um, so this is so this version right here you can see how they did like this filter effect where it's like red and then more blue down here you don't really see it as well on the screen but that's basically what's going on it's a photographic filter effect well it kind of emulates what's going on with the flag of the netherlands we've got this reddish here and then blue down there now normally why would that would that be an issue well the fact that indonesia actually was a dutch colony until 1949 and so you're sending this image to the government of Indonesia with this kind of overlaid, you know, not so subtle Dutch flag on it. What kind of message are you potentially sending? And so I know it's hyper subtle, but that kind of stuff matters because again, I did some A-B testing with people to see if they can notice and, and Indonesian friends, there a couple of them actually picked it up. They're like, that's really pretty. I know where that is. Why is there a Dutch flag on the image? I'm like, okay, um, we'll change it. And this was a super easy fix. All we did is we basically took the red out. We just made it more of a monochromatic blue um, kind of uh, image. And that's, that's all it took. Um, something like this can be super complicated too. So this game, if you don't know Fantasy of the Journey West, it is the most popular MMO in China. It's been popular for many, many years. Um, thousands, millions of players. I think at one point it had like 300 million registered users or something. It's crazy. And this is based on Chinese mythology and history. So it's like there's one of the, that's one of the reasons it's so relevant to China. And um, some, some of the most successful games in China do have a basis in Chinese mythology and or history. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of games in China, it's hard for a lot of games to penetrate China because they don't have the same kind of cultural context as the games being created in China. And so it's a lot of times people have a, um, it's not as easy to find that cultural relevance, to find that connection. The problem that happened here, as you might be able to guess if you've been looking at the image, is that this, this was a particular office within the game. And this wall mural, which kind of emulates a particular Japanese flag during World War II, 
um, this wasn't taken very well by people. As, um, and so one of the things that happened is that there was an anti-Japan faction within the game made up of several hundred people, and they decided to protest this. And so on the day of the anniversary of the, Jap of the uh, Chinese-Japanese War, um, they basically crowded into this office, 80,000 players, and were crashing the servers and causing all kinds of problems because they all felt that that image was basically somebody who made the game was making a political statement that China actually should be dominated by Japan or something like that. So basically you had these right-wing anti-Japan people who took over the game for a while and got really pissed off about it. And um, the company was silent for at least two or three weeks. And then finally they came out and said, well, no, the artwork is actually based on this artwork, which is a Chinese painting, which I think, basically, I think they spent two or three weeks trying to find this painting so they could use that as an excuse, because this really doesn't look much like anything like, oops, like that image right there. It kind of does, but not entirely. So I think it's a weak excuse, but that's me. So. Then there's simple things like this. So <laughs> this is a really easy one to fix. And so sometimes they just try and be too cute about something and it just doesn't work. And so this, this was not on the shelf very long. This is a Korean dictionary. And so they just quickly changed to this instead because you know sometimes you'd be a little too clever and it's gonna backfire on you. Um, of course, Warcraft, one of the examples a lot of people talk to me about is like they've heard about Warcraft having, having to be changed in China. And yes, they did change it in China because showing skeletons um, is a problem. So you can see like this is the pile of bones that originally exists in the game. And then this is the version that you saw in China. So there, there's some bones around, but it's not as blatant as have just a giant pile of bones. And it's, it's never been 100% completely crystal clear why the government made this call. Um, there is a relationship towards the use of skeletons and of, of, uh, in the relationship to ancestors in the Chinese culture. But another part of it is the, chi the Chinese government, as they often do, kept saying it's not harmonious. They like using the term harmony. So it's not harmonious with our values to see skeletons like this. There's all kinds of other stuff they allow, like bloody stuff, but the skeletons are a problem. Or like this one where you can see where like there's the hanging bodies and then in that version they're just, they're gone. Um, so it's very subtle and sometimes it's not even consistent and that's one of the problems that I've seen with the Chinese market. Sometimes it depends on which customs agent is actually looking at your game at the time. You know, it's like you can get different answers sometimes. It's not always 100% consistent. Um, now, geopolitical imaginations, here's another layer. So basically, countries like to reinforce territory through images, and they like to tell you, basically remind you what they own or what they think they own. And so um, sometimes this stuff can be super sensitive. So like when I worked on Ninja Gaiden, you can see this, this was a problem right here because here, this was just the option screen for Ninja Gaiden 2, and you could go select your country. Well, right here in this one line, there's, there's three m massive problems that will get this game banned in China instantly. Number one, you're using the term ROC, Republic of China. They're using that term for Taiwan. You use that, that's the term of independent Taiwan. And so you use Republic of China and your game will be banned instantly. They're also showing the flag of Taiwan. That's also a bannable offense because again, that's a symbol of sovereignty of Taiwan. And the other thing is be, by using the term country, you're basically, you're, you're kind of doubling down on your political statement by saying the Republic of China is a country. And by the way, here's their flag. And so that's a huge problem, just that simple line like that. So one of the things I did on a lot of projects I worked on, not just games either, as I said, make it really easy for yourself say country slash region, because country slash region removes you from having to determine that that object, whatever it is, is a country or not. And I also told them use the ta term Taiwan because it's acceptable both by China and by people in Taiwan. And so now when you get to this screen, if you're from Taiwan, you can say, yeah, I'm a country, boom, Taiwan. If you're in China, say, no, Taiwan's a region of China, boom. Let, defer the choice to the user. If you can defer to their perception, you don't have to deal with this mess. It's like, fine, this is not gonna be my problem. And take the flag out, because the flag is completely redundant. It does, why have the flag and the country name? It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, 
So right there, you solved it. Now you don't have to worry about that field ever again. Um, unless you put something really, like you put Palestine in there, then that could be an issue too. But anyway, um, other things like this. So in South Korea, there was a, at one point in South Korea, all three of these games were banned because they showed North Korea as an antagonist. And so the, there, there are long-term prospects or long-term goals to reunify the North and South, although it seems extremely unlikely right now. But I know the South Korean government still would like to see that someday. If you go to South, if you go to South Korea, if you go to like a government office, you'll see a map of Korea and it shows the entire peninsula. They don't show like just South Korea. Um, so they, they, they basically, whoa, sorry. Um, so basically, all three of these were banned at one point, and so um, in this movie, when it came out, um, Die Another Day, this movie was not banned, but it was protested, because the main antagonist of this game was North Korean, or of this movie, excuse me. And so that right there shows a little bit of a difference between how games and film are treated. They both have the exact same issue, but the film was not banned but the games were. And so what, what I find interesting though is at some point a consumer group in Korea, they actually protested the government and said, we should be able to play these games. And to their credit, the Korean government said, yeah, you should. So they allowed them, now that you can play those games in Korea. Now I happen to think that that decision coincided more with the time when, that's about r around the time when North Korea started lobbing more missiles at South Korea. And so I think the South Korean government was more like, you know what, maybe they are an antagonist. Sure, you can play those games. That's kind of how I feel it went, but I don't really know. And then things like this. So this game, Hearts of Iron, if you've never played it, it's like the board game Risk, where you basically try and take over the world in different sections. And you can see how China's divided up into all these different sections, but the government banned these games because Tibet and Taiwan were not being shown as part of China, um, specifically Tibet and Taiwan. And so they just banned the games outright and said, nope, you're not going to play these here. What I find super interesting about this is that these games, they take place in World War II. The People's Republic of China did not exist until 1949, after World War II. And so basically the Chinese government in this example is, is, is basically reinforcing their sovereignty of what they believe they own back into the past before they technically existed. And so that gets a little more problematic because then you're dealing with a government's perception, not just of today, but of yesterday and the ancient past. That's actually why if you follow the news, that's exactly the grounds for, for excuse me, um, why China's building islands down in the South China Sea, because they basically assert that we've always owned the South China Sea. And they claim to prove it, but they don't have really any proof. So um, it's really controversial, and it's also probably where the next war is really going to break out down there, if not up there in North Korea. Um, now, in the world of cartography, just to give you an example, as a cartographer, one of the things I did after I left Microsoft is I, consult, I consulted with Google for six years and I created their geopolitical team as well. And so one, one of the things that we did is we perfected what we call domain tailoring. And so in the different map domains across Google Maps, for example, you will see different versions of, of reality um, because it's, sometimes it's required by law. And so here, you can see most of the world sees this version of Northern India, where Jammu and Kashmir is all divided up. And um, like this is Aksai Chin, which is owned by China. This is uh, Gilgit Baltistan, which is uh, occupied by Pakistan. This is the state of Jammu and Kashmir, occupied by India. And so it's all disputed. It's a big mess. It's been a mess for decades. Well, in India, by law, you must show Jammu and Kashmir as Indian territory without, without question. If you don't show it, you don't sell your product in, in, doesn't matter if it's a game, doesn't matter if it's a map, you will not sell in India if you don't show the map like this. And that is required by law. And so that, again, that's a geopolitical imagination. That's India reinforcing what they want you to believe they actually own, but in truth, they actually don't. Um, so finally, um, just to kind of wrap this up a bit, talking about some key considerations, and obviously, I could go on for days with examples and all kinds of other aspects of culturalization, and I always love to, but we don't want to sit here forever, so, and I'm sure you're tired of hearing me. But, um, so, I want to talk about some really important things, though, as we, as we wrap this up, things you have to consider. So one of the things is the, is the target audience, and this is really important to think about. So it, the way I see it in a really simplified way, there's two primary audiences for game content. So one is the intended audience. 
So those are basically the people who play the games. They, they, you know, they, they play a lot of games. They understand context issues. They, they don't really even think about it. These people primarily, I'm saying these people, that I'm one of them, I love playing games. Um, all we really care about is if the game sucks or not. That's what we're focused on. This game is super fun. I, I think I'll play it the rest of the day. Or this game sucks, I'm tired of it. You know, we kind of think more on the gamer level, on the gameplay level, and the enrichment to us as entertainment. We don't... <laughs> Um, the he the proactive culturalization is done for the benefit of those who play games because we want them to enjoy the games even more the reactive culturalization is done more for those who don't play games because those are the ones who are going to have the knee jerk reaction um, as typically happens today games are still i think especially in political circles games are still viewed in a lot of countries as toys not games or art and so their reaction is more like a defective toy so for example they think of a game if it has something problematic or offensive in it it's the same as having a frisbee you throw it if you throw the frisbee and every time it comes back and hits you on the head no matter what you do they're gonna want to ban that frisbee it's like that frisbee is bad it's poorly designed it has to get off the market and unfortunately a lot of a lot of governments still view games that way so if a game has something bad in it they're like this game has to go away we can't have this and that's bullshit but that's just kind of what we're dealing with at the moment it will change we know it's going to change there is always a generational change with media adoption and we're slowly getting there but it's still going to take a while the other thing, of course, I think is a sort of a no-brainer, but I think it's worth mentioning, is distri uh, distribution in the content cloud, which is what we do today. I kind of miss the old days, 20 years ago, of releasing DVDs because we kind of can control the physical media and where it went to some degree. Um, today, you can't control anything. So obviously, your content is going to be instantly exposed to the world. It's going to have an instant global audience um, that's going to be multicultural in nature, and you can't control that. Um, it's going to happen. You release your game, I don't care where you release it on Steam or whatever else, it will instantly be on streets like on a DVD in Shanghai tomorrow morning that quickly. That's the way the world works now. And so whether it's on a DVD or whether it's just, you know, shows up on Pirate Bay or somewhere else, that's the way it is. And um, so basically it means when your content is, quote, done and you release it to the world, you better hope that the content that you're putting out there best represents your best intentions about what you wanted to create. Um, we also know with community that activism happens at every level. And so if you have people who love what you do, you're going to get this outpouring of love from all over the world, from the Twitterverse and everywhere else, and it feels really great. But if you do something wrong, it's the exact opposite. And you will get piled upon and attacked and threatened and harassed and all those other things that happen in today's social media environment. And we know this makes a big difference. It, it has a huge effect on, on the way things work in today's business world. And the other thing that I want to emphasize about this is what we're really dealing with this issue of mind share. So a lot of people sometimes wonder, why do I focus so much on what on governments and what the governments think? Well, mainly because in a lot of markets, the government controls the distribution, whether we like it or not. In a lot of Western markets, that's not the case. Like in the US, the government doesn't control distribution. Walmart and Target do. Walmart controls what shows up on the shelf. Amazon controls what shows up in their market. If Amazon says we're never gonna sell an adult-only rated game, well, there will not be adult-only games created because nobody can sell them. And so it's, it's frustrating for people who wanna create games that might be of that nature, that wanna push boundaries and push artistic boundaries because the retail channel at the moment is not there yet. 
But in a lot of other markets, the issue is that the governments are basically fighting for mindshare. That, that is what really concerns them, is that games are a threat to mindshare in terms of who controls the narrative of our country and our culture. That's the whole reason why the Great Firewall of China exists. It's to create a cultural firewall around China so that the gov government can help, pro quote, protect its people from viewpoints outside of China that might be counter to what the government desires. And so there's other, other government, excuse me, there's other governments that do that to other degrees, but China's the most blatant example that does that. And so that's why we have to be super careful about it, but ironically, it's also the mark, one of the largest, fastest growing markets out there in the world. And so I find so many developers, companies and individuals conflicted over this because like, I don't want to give in to selling something to China because I disagree with the government's politics there and how they treat you know, people in terms of their information access. And yet I know it's like this huge you know, mountain of gold waiting for me to access. And so, well, that's, that's going to lead to a separate issue that I'll mention here in a minute. Um, another thing that's important, this kind of goes back to my cosplay pictures. And the reason is this, because the cosplay, all that shows you is what a total geek I am. And I watch tons of sci-fi and fantasy, and I read a lot, and I, I do a lot. Of, it's, I guess it's research, but it's just me being a geek. But that actually helps me tremendously because so many of the, so much of the game content is also tends to be more sci-fi and fantasy based. Not all of it, but a lot of it. So knowing what came before is super critical in my job. So when I look at game, other games, I look at films, television, other things that help inform me on what may or may not be allowed in different markets because. Um, you know, what, what, more than once we've had an issue with a developer who the government's pushing back and they'll say, well, we're not going to let you do that. And I can say, really, back in 2011, you, released, you allowed this film to release in your borders that had almost the exact same issue in it. So what's your excuse there? You will let the film do it, but you're not letting this game do it in 2017. Why? And sometimes you can catch the government off guard because they're not going to re always remember that because they're, you know, massive bureaucracies. And so it helps to know that sometimes. You're not trying to be, you know, stuff it up their nose in an angry way. You're just trying to say, oh, by the way, we're just trying to understand why is there an inconsistency because you allowed it before and now you're not allowing it. So can you please explain that? Sometimes that works, sometimes it won't, but it's, it's really helpful to know that because precedent really does matter with a lot of these issues. Um, so freedom of creativity, this is extremely important to keep in mind because anytime I've given a lecture about culturalization, people inevitably say, well, what if I want to make a game that's offensive? What if I want to use the, the offensive material as marketing? What if I want to leverage that as my main point for getting attention? You know what? I don't care. I don't care what you do. I'm not here to be a political correctness police. I'm not here to be a, you know, to basically be a gateway for what people release. My job is to protect the company against backlash if they want to be protected. That's the thing. And usually if they hire me to do my job, then that, that's them telling me that we want your help. We don't don't want to be banned somewhere. Um, I think it's extremely important for game developers to exercise their creative vision uh, without reservation. Do exactly what you want to do, but you just have to remember in the back of your head that your vision may not meet the expectations of local markets. So then the next question is, do I give a shit if it meets the local expectations of those markets? You don't have to if you don't want to. That's your choice. That's where you have to draw the line. I'm not telling you you must. I'm saying, but if you want to sell your game outside of a little bubble where you created it, you do have to think about this stuff. So you have to be extremely conscious of your creative decisions during this whole world building process, like I mentioned. But you, and also, like I said, be willing to have those challenging discussions around intent. So like, what do we intend to do with this game? Are we making a political statement? Or are we making no statement at all, but maybe we've got something in the game that could be potentially controversial. And so what are we gonna do about it? One of the things you have to think about is this whole competing goals of art and commerce. So you have to be aware that um, this dynamic does affect your decisions around world building. So again, feel free to create your, to follow your creative vision, but understand the motivation that drives your creative vision. So when I talk to a lot of developers, inevitably they're somewhere along the spectrum. Um, I don't meet a lot of developers who are, cre are creating games strictly for art, meaning they're gonna just, they're gonna finish their degree, 
make games, not make any money off them. They're just going to release them to the world as art pieces and just hope people play them. I know a few people like that, but they, have, they also have day jobs. So they, that's what their hobby. So they make little games like that as a hobby and they release them every once in a while. Most of us, though, who are, in, who are professionally in the game industry are somewhere in the middle here. We definitely want artistic expression. We want artistic freedom. We want to be able to do that, but we also want to make money off what we're doing, which if you have any desire to make money off what you're doing, then a lot of the stuff I mentioned in this talk you have to think about at some level because that's when you're exposing yourself to market forces, which means you're exposing yourself to consumers, you're exposing yourself to governments, you're exposing yourself to how the market works. Um, this little thing in the middle I call the fulcrum of compromise. So you often have to kind of think about where you are going to sit on this, uh, on this scale. Now for most indie developers, they become indie because they want more of this. They want artistic freedom because they're more independent. They can, they can follow their own vision. Um, they're not necessarily doing it for the money necessarily. If they are, then they probably should go into banking or real estate instead. Um, but, and that's why we see more indies that I, that I meet tend to be over on this side. AAA stuff is over on the maximized revenue. And what's the proof of that? That's why you have Halo 26 and Call of Duty 17 and games that are franchises that go on and on and on and on. And they don't tend to innovate a lot. They innovate a little. Um, they tend to be the same thing, but gamers love them. They keep buying GTA and they keep buying Halo and they keep buying Call of Duty. I play them too. I like playing these games. They're technically amazing because they've got hundreds if not thousands of people working on them and hundreds of millions of dollars being pumped into them, but they have to do this. They have to make money, which means they cannot necessarily always deviate too far from the vision of what that franchise is supposed to be. So that's why I hear a lot of people complaining that it tends to be more stagnant over on that side. It's like, well, yeah, I'll play the next Assassin's Creed Origins. Why not? It looks kind of cool. But I'm really excited about that indie game I saw at that festival in such and such place a couple months ago. That's what I really want to play. Um, and so it's interesting. Um, I, I think that dynamic is, it's out there. Um, I think for each one of us, we have to kind of think about, you know, you don't make a conscious decision, well, I'm going to be 70% here. That's not what it is. It's just basically, what is your motivation? I, I gave a talk in Melbourne a about a month ago at PAX Australia, and one of the developers did stand up and, and he said, well, my main motivation is this, I want to make money. That's why I'm going into games. Again, you're in the wrong business. <laughs> you are in the wrong business. You should be making games because you love games and you have the skill and you really want to do it and that's, that's your desire. So, um, so yeah, so when it comes to the culturalization stuff, my job is basically, my, my real job is to basically help developers maximize their global reach of their content. And because I want as many people as possible to enjoy their creative vision. That's my goal. That's my personal goal when I help them. Now, if that means for them making more money, that's great. I'm happy for them. But my, my goal really is to make sure that I, as best as I can, preserve their artistic vision, but make sure it's transferable to as many cultures as possible. That's what I want. And so there are times, though, when the developer, when we'll have these conversations and I'll say, you might need to change this for this market or whatever, they're like, I really don't want to do that. I'm like, that's fine. That's, that's okay. You can say that, but you have to be prepared. What are you going to say if your game ends up in that market and somebody like the government or someone gets pissed off about it? What are you going to say? And you should probably have an answer ready. And so that's a lot of times I encourage the developers, you don't have to, you don't have to change your game to be politically correct. You don't have to change it to, to fit everyone's expectations, but you do need to at least be ready to answer if it happens, why did you not change it? Because the issue is that almost 99% uh, of the time, if, some, if your game causes somebody to be offended in a local market, they think it was intentional. They believe you did that for a reason. And you know you weren't trying to. Um, so that's, that's why you need to respond in a way that's intelligent and, and uh, you know, and calm and diplomatic, you know, you know, and basically have your reason to answer. Um, I've had, I've seen developers fall into great trouble because they'll respond to backlash. They'll say, well, we just felt like doing it that way. It's like, really? So you did want to offend us. Great. Well, now you piss off. We don't want to buy any of your games in the future. You know, but if they said, well, 
we thought it through, we did our research, we talked to like these academics who are experts in the subject and we kind of talked it through and we eventually decided that after going through this due diligence process, we said we're going to do this because of this reason, you know, our creative vision kind of, it aligns more with our creative vision and what we wanted to do for that particular character or whatever scenario. It's a more reasoned, intelligent answer. You're not just blowing them off by saying, well, we just wanted to do it that way. You're saying, well, no, we thought about it. We really did think about it and we did our research, but we just decided to go in that direction instead. And we are, we're sorry that it offended you. You know, that kind of response is completely rational and okay to do. Um, so you just gotta be responsible about, responsible about it though. Uh, not just kind of blow them off and say, I'm a, cre I'm a creative artist, so screw you. Um, you can do that too, but just I'll get the popcorn and watch what happens. Um, so that's it for my lecture part. So um, thank you very much. And if there's any questions. Thank you, Kate, for an excellent lecture. I'm sure that we all learned quite a lot. Uh, do you have any questions? I'm here very close to Kate because of the microphone, so, <laughs> so it might seem a little bit weird. But there are already <laughs> questions, so wait for Lassie's uh, microphone. Uh, hello, I was... Is this thing on? Now it is. Yeah. Okay, uh, hi, I was just curious if you have any interesting cases or anecdotes regarding um, either, you know, proactive or reactive adaptation of content in regards to Eastern European markets, because those have also been go growing a lot in the last couple of, I would say, almost a decade now. Yeah. So. Maybe repeat the question so that... Yes. Sure so, so the question was, have there been any issues, either reactive or proactive culturalization in Eastern Europe? Um, because it has been growing quite a bit recently. Um, I'm trying to think of any examples that really kind of jump out. Um, I know that um, when I worked on Call of Duty Modern Warfare, there was the whole airport scene, the infamous airport scene that um, caused some issues. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, part of it was, um, I remember working on that and there was some, I remember some of the Russian friends and colleagues were a little bit like pissed off about it because they're like, that is like so stereotyped. You know, to kind of say, well, yeah, that's what Russians do. They're going to go in an airport and gun down all the civilians. Um, and, you know, so sometimes I think it's just a matter of the unfortunate alignment of an action with a, a nationality or culture. Um, but that is one of the consider considerations you have to make as a game developer is like, if you choose, especially if it's a real world culture and you're saying that, okay, we're going to have the Russians are the antagonists and we're going to have them do this deplorable act against civilians in this game. Is that really the way we want to do it? And how well is that going to play when we actually try and sell the game in Russia? And um, that is something you have to think about. And, um, but, you know, if, if you say, well, that's the narrative, that's the way it is, we'll just stick with it. Um, so, and I think part of it too that I've noticed that because Russia has been so infamous with its piracy rates, uh, which um, despite that, they still project that within a few years, it's gonna be the eighth largest uh, market for revenue, game revenue in the world, which is astounding to me, um, considering that, that point. So I don't really have a lot of other examples though, but I do think that, um, yeah, I mean, it's something we have to be more conscious of, obviously, because I mean, there's a lot more, I mean, tons of localization and culturalization being focused on Eastern Europe now. Um, it's, it's growing very quickly. I mean, well, just one example I will give that I know anecdotally is that I thought was really, really cool. So I was talking with my colleagues in Poland and they said that um, when they did Mass Effect, um, I guess when they, when, I don't know the actors in Poland, but apparently they were able to secure one of the actors to do the voiceover for the male shepherd and it was like the, the Robert De Niro of Poland, like really good actor. And they said once they secured him, they got like the Meryl Streep of Poland and all these other like famous Polish actors all got involved with the voiceover work for Mass Effect. And my friends who are fluent English and Polish speakers, they, they actually feel that the Polish version of, Ma of the original Mass Effect is like way better because the voice talent, the caliber of the voice talent, not to say the English one is bad, but you know, it's just, I just thought that was kind of interesting that they kind of made it like this national thing that we're gonna show people that our voice work is awesome. I think that's cool. Uh, hi, uh, thank you very much for a great lecture, uh, especially like the the part about the Arbiter in, ha in Halo 2 because that was 
I'm a Halo fan, that was very new to me. Mm -hmm. uh, on that point, though, I th I think it is quite like kind of like interesting because, like as you said, there is a lot of like religious uh, figures, a lot of religious like referencing in especially in Halo series. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking like that, yeah, sure, like changing uh, the name to Arbiter for sure, like changed the um, like distance the reference uh, and or like from the original. But doesn't it still matter quite a lot that all that reference and all that like all that setting is there still? Or do you think it's like it, it's it's simply that you know it's more distance, so it doesn't really matter after that point? Yeah. So, so uh, yeah. So there, there's a. Do you want me to repeat that or no? Maybe. Yes. Okay, so basically in Halo 2, it's like even though we took out the, we changed the dervish term, but doesn't the other stuff matter? Because there are a lot of re other religious references in Halo. Um, and you're right, there are. And I think the, the main, there's, there's a lot of the things that are, that are at play with Halo. First of all, it's a massive franchise. And it's like, it's going to barrel roll over pretty much everything anyway, at least at its heyday, like with Halo 2, because it was such a massively anticipated title. And that's one of the reasons why we were trying to be super careful with Halo 2, because the first one was so successful, and we knew the second one also had to be, we, I mean, this is, you know, it's like, it's like the Empire Strikes Back. It's got to be good. It has to be good. Like, Episode 8 better be good. But, um, you know, it, it has to be good. And so... So I know we were thinking consciously about that, but it's like, okay, well, the, the content's going to speak for itself. The story is solid. Pretty much everything about the game is, is okay. And we can't, obviously, we can't deviate too much because we already introduced sort of those religious themes in the first Halo game. You know, you already knew about the, the prophets and, and all of that kind of stuff. And we just took it a little bit deeper in Halo 2. So you can't deviate completely from that now. I mean, you've got to kind of stay the course with the, that's logical consistency. You don't want to just all of a sudden, like, introduce something like, well, you know what, everything you saw in the original Halo, that's not really what's going on. Um, so we had to maintain the logical consistency of the Halo world and what's going on and the motivation of the Covenant leaders and of the Covenant itself. And so it was basically just a matter of what can we do just to ensure that it's not that blatant, you know, that it's not that obvious. And I, you know, that was with the dervish term it was like, it's just too obvious because it's, it's a term that's very specific. You know, what if what if the character was called the Pope? Honestly, just just use another religious term. What if he had been called the Pope instead? So Master Chief and the Pope are going around, you know, working together, and it's like that'd just be weird. You know, I mean, it's for a lot of Catholics, it'd be super weird. It's like I don't understand this. It's like why is he called the Pope? Um, you know, so I, I think it's just one of those things where one of, one of the choices that you make when you do things like that, especially because dervish is a term that is known, uh, obviously it's, a, it's known in the West, we know it like as the whirling dervishes of Turkey and things like that, but within that specific faith, dervish has a specific function. Um, and so a lot of times what we, what we try and do, we'll make a surgical change like that so as not to disrupt the experience for somebody in that market who's playing the game. So you're playing along, you're having an awesome time enjoying the game, and all of a sudden, boom, you see this one thing that you're just like, wait, I was having fun playing this game, and now all of a sudden I'm like back in my own culture being offended by something. I don't understand. And it's like we don't, we don't want them to have that kind of experience. And so we felt that... It's, it's kind of like, yeah, there's, it's almost like you have a background, background noise of cultural issues like religious references and things like that, sort of this ongoing noise within the game where you're making kind of references and stuff, but it's almost like it's a spike. So you have like, yeah, there's prophets, there's quasi-religious worship, the halo rings, it's kind of humming along, but then all of a sudden you hear a dervish, it's like, and um, that's the kind of thing we're trying to avoid. It's kind of like that one spike that kind of jars you out of the experience. And for most people, you wouldn't be jarred out of the experience. It's for the people that affects, you know. And so that's, again, where we're trying to, like, maximize the reach of the content by making sure that that one issue is not going to be a problem in such a large group, which is the Muslim market. I have a question from the stream. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, uh, one about holding the status quo. So Patrick from the stream is asking, uh, thanking for the, for the lecture, but asking what do you mean when you say no political statement at all? Um, and when you're using examples, um, they are all about upholding the status quo, which is also a political statement. 
Uh, do you consider that when discussing the big critical questions? Yes, we do. So it, it depends on what it depends on the game itself. Um, you know, some games some games do kind of have a, a not so subtle message in them. Um, for example, I worked on a game called Ninja Blade, which probably nobody remembers, but there you go. Um, so Ninja Blade had a had a political figure in the game who looked and sounded a lot like Bill Clinton, but he was not Bill Clinton at all. But it, that's just who they modeled the character after. Um, and I mean, if you played the game, you'd probably say, wow, that sounds and looks like Bill Clinton. Um, okay, that in and of itself, no big deal. He's supposed to be US president, so they just modeled it after Bill Clinton, whatever. Um, but what they did, though, is then they had that particular character enact. He kept using the term, I'm going to create the final solution. I'm going to enact the final solution, which if you know your history and you know what Hitler used to describe the actions they took against the Jews, that's the term that Hitler used, was the final solution. And so that's a term that we avoid. We don't want to use that term in a political context or other contexts because of what it connotes. And especially in the context of that particular game, we were talking about a form of genocide within the game. It's like, we don't, we're not going to do this all over again. We're not going to use that term. Um, you know. And so that's one of those cases where, OK, we could have just thrown it in the game and just let it go. And so, so you've got this Bill Clinton-like president who's saying, we're going to create the final solution. It's like, so would that piss people off? Yeah, I know it would. I know it would, there was a lot of people who would be potentially pissed off by it. Um, we talk about the implications of that. Um, and so I don't know if that helps or not, but um, but basically, I don't think a lot of the times we we like over discuss the political implications. We don't. Um, a lot of it's mainly about the creative vision and whether or not it's going to work with the general culture of that time. Now, sometimes the politics does feed into it, though, because we might be dealing with a market that just had a regime change. They just had a presidential change. Um, they just might have, which may have shifted their values dramatically. Like maybe they just just uh, you know elected a right wing populist leader, and that could have a different kind of reaction than it would have before the election. And so that kind of stuff we do think about sometimes, but generally we don't really think that much about it. You know, we just don't. It's like if it if it if the game itself has such an overly politicized theme that we need to discuss that implication, that we will. But a lot of times we don't. There are more questions from the stream, so okay. if you have any questions in the audience, just uh, next after this. So Christina from the stream is, ask, uh, stream is asking that a lot of the examples are uh, things that we see on the surface, and they are fairly easy to correct through cosmetic changes. Mm -hmm. Do you have any examples of game mechanics or other larger issues not working in a cultural context? Yes. <laughs> so in my career, um, I've worked on many, many, many games, and there's two examples, which I can't name by name, but I can mention at least one of them um, that was that we basically stopped the game because it was fundamentally flawed from the start. And what I, I'll give you a little bit of context for it. So the game was actually being designed to appeal to Native American players, um, which in itself was a noble idea, Especially at a time when I don't think a lot of companies were even thinking about like appealing to Native American gamers out there. So I thought, well, that's nice. It's a neat idea that you would even want to do that. But the execution was so terrible and it was so stereotyped. It was horrific in terms of, you know, the way that they were conceiving of this game. They did not have Native Americans working on this game, for starters. So that was a problem. So you had basically all these white people coming up with what they thought Native American players would like. And um, so when I, by the time I got involved, they'd already spent about 400,000 US on the development of this project. And when I sat down with the team leaders and the writers and all that, and I was just like, no. I'm like, I'm telling you right now, this is such a flawed idea. You might think, I mean, you know the, the saying, the road to hell is paved with good intentions? This game completely defined that 
that phrase. Um, it really was. And because I kept telling my, I can guarantee you that the moment this game comes out, it will get so much backlash from the Native American community for being such a horrible idea. And I tested this too. This was when I was at Microsoft. And so one of the great advantages of working at a large company is that there's a lot of internal diversity groups at the company, especially at a multinational company like Microsoft. So there was like Muslims at Microsoft and blacks at Microsoft, women at Microsoft, Native Americans at Microsoft, all of these huge internal groups. What's great about using them is they're all under NDA. So I could, I could show them this stuff and say, hey, I need your feedback. So on that particular example, I did. I said, what do you guys think about this idea? And some of them were saying, I'm ashamed to work at this company. I cannot believe that somebody at this company came up with this idea. And so that was pretty much all we needed. Just like, OK, this has to go away. And um, that's really rare that it would happen like that, but that was just ill-conceived from the start. I mean, that's obviously where somebody at the start of that project should have stepped back and say, are we even the right people to be doing this? You know, I think today, in today's climate, because that was at least 15 years ago, to, in today's climate, it would be a lot different. I don't think you, they would even consider doing it. Um, without having Native Americans involved. Like if you've played Never Alone, or if you've heard about the game Never Alone, which I did a little bit of consulting on, um, it's a phenomenal game. And they, they, they had a great deal of input from the Inuit people up in you know, northern North America. And it was just, it was fantastic. Um, they did such a great job on that game. And the, the way they incorporated a lot of the indigenous lore, indigenous design into the game was a great example. So, um, so it can be done right. You know, it's just, you gotta be really careful about that kind of stuff. Hi, so um, I have two questions actually. So I think you kind of briefly mentioned this before in like uh, in the case for Polish uh, voiceover, but was there any like an opposite cases from the backslashings that you actually worked out by yeah. changing something in specific to that region when distributing it? Like, and then another question would be, so a lot of things like happens, errors happen because the game developers didn't know that that was so sensitive. In that case, when you're telling them that it might be sensitive, how try not to be so much of a teaching process, or how do you communicate without going to backslash within the community <laughs> of game developers? Um, okay, so the, in the first question, I don't, I can't really think of any quick example for that off the top of my head. Um, maybe something will come to me. Um, in the second question, um, it's, you know, it's funny because I got my degrees in geography and pretty much the only option you have as a geographer is to teach or to work for the government. And somehow I ended up working at Microsoft. So, so I kind of lucked out in that way and found my own little weird career path. Um, but I love teaching. And I really do. I love lecturing. I love teaching. And every one of those moments that I worked with the developers on, I saw it as a teachable moment. And I try and work with them. I try not, I don't talk down to them. I talk with them about what their assumptions were and kind of kind of walk them through the logic of what, what how they made their decision and whether or not that the, the process of making the decision actually works for basically the whole goals of the game. So, so I basically, I try and examine how they came to that decision, the creative decision, and then I will point out to them, like maybe here's a, at that point in the decision-making process, maybe that's when you should have asked this question about like the international dimension, you know, so rather than just kind of go from A to B, there's like a few couple more steps in between you should have taken um, to get to that point. So I really try and work with them. I, I actually see myself, especially a lot of the projects I've done, um, like when I was at Microsoft and elsewhere, because I was, my work was always alongside their work. My work was not like necessarily in the milestones, sometimes it was, but usually I had to basically like run alongside them, say, hey, by the way, did you check this too? Um, and, um, and try and get their attention while they've got all their other goals too. And so I always kind of saw myself as a creative partner to work with them on these things. I mean, there's times where they would send me artwork and say, what, what do you think should be changed? I would just take it into Photoshop myself and just show them and I would just change it. And I would just say, if you do it like this, and, they'll, and it'll work perfectly fine. They said, then that, we'll just use that then. We'll just do it that way. And so I basically tried to make their job as easy as I could by kind of working alongside them and helping them understand that I'm not there to destroy their vision. 
you know, which a lot of times because the angle I'm coming from, there's a lot of paranoia because, you know, sometimes they would call me the PC police and stuff like that. And, or I would show up in the, in the, the working meeting and it's like, oh God, what does she want now? You know, it's like, no, it's just, I'm, I'm there to help. And so it's just because I was more known for the reactive culturalization stuff. So it's usually they associated my presence that I'm going to say something I found is like really bad. But that's not always what I found. It's just like sometimes it would be more instructive in nature. It's like, oh, by the way, I noticed you guys are going to be implementing this kind of system. You should maybe think about these things as you're creating it. That's all I want you to know. It's kind of like what I did with Dance Central. After I saw the very first build of the first version of the game, I saw they were having issues with gestures and how to use gestures. So what I did is I wrote a primer for them on how to use gestures. Just general high level stuff, like here's how you can incorporate gestures, here's things to think about. And so the next build I saw, they fixed so many things. I was stunned that they actually listened to me. They actually did the stuff that I told them to do. And every build after that, it was like very minor little things. It was, it was not like these major things anymore. And so that's as much as I can, that's where I try and basically give them the foundation to do a better job from there forward, rather than just always waiting for them to trip up. Because I don't want them to do that, because it's a waste of everyone's time. I have a related question on that. Since we are here at uh, university mm -hmm. campus, uh, how do we how could we actually address this in the thinking about the future game creators in the game education? How do we do that? Or what, is, it, is it more like networking with, uh, with the other students that actually will be coming the experts? Is it about the game education or the networking? I think it's both. I mean, it's the, I think part of it, I mean, honestly, I know it's a cliche to say this, but awareness is half the battle. You know, it's kind of like it sounds like a public service announcement, but it's it's true. It's like a lot of times when I've given a talk like this to developers, it's just the. Uh, I mean, most of the time I get the reaction like, "Huh, I never thought of this stuff before." I, I you know, I've heard about like Warcraft skeletons, and I've heard about stuff like that, but they just, generally speaking, people just say, I just never thought about it like this before. And so now they're like, okay, now I at least have some kind of framework for how I look at my work. I either get that reaction or I'll get people coming up, up to me afterwards saying, we're working on a game and now I'm really scared. So <laughs> I, get that, I get that reaction a lot. Um, There's a final question from the stream. Uh, how, how do the big platforms like Steam factor into the making of global culture? Maybe that also relates a little bit to that because... That's a great question because yeah. Steam is messed up. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I think Steam can do a far better job at what they do. Um, I think for one thing, Steam should incorporate regionalization. So wouldn't it be cool to go on Steam and like see, I want to see all the games coming out of Egypt. I want to see all the games coming out of Finland or whatever, you know, they don't do that as well as they could. I think one of the things that is sorely lacking in game development right now is a better sense of curation to help, um, to help the consumer find the kind of games they want. I think it's a serious problem in our industry because I hear so many people on the consumer side, because I speak to all sides of the problem, and they're like, I, I, I like games, but I just can't, I don't know what to find. I mean, all I see are like the big posters for like Assassin's Creed and Call of Duty and stuff, but what else is out there? It's like, ah, oh, there's like tens of thousands of things out there, but it's like they don't, we don't make it easy for them. On the film side, for many years and decades, you've seen all these different kind of collections. Like if you've ever heard of the Criterion Collection, um, Criterion Collection is like very highly curated, like best of the best films ever made. Um, you, if you go, you know, you go look up the Criterion Collection movies, you know, like these are some of the best films ever. And I think it'd be really helpful for us to do that kind of curation to help consumers find what they want to find. Like what if somebody only wants to play horror games? It's like, how do they find them? If they only want to play platformers, they only want to play these certain kind of games. And I just don't think we've made... I mean, we're kind of shooting ourselves in the foot by not helping the consumer find our stuff. And I think Steam is part of that. But I also think there is an international dimension to that as well. Um, although there is and there isn't. It's like, to be honest, it's like, I guess maybe I'm, I'm being a little bit biased because like, I would love to know where the games are from because I'm fascinated with what the kinds of games I see come out of different markets. Like when I was in Brazil a few months ago in Sao Paulo for the Brazilian Indie, uh, indie Game Festival, amazing stuff. Their, their artistic style, it's like representative of part of Brazilian culture. It's just, it's so unique and it's so rich. Um, 
and you're not, you know, so how do, how do their games get noticed in North America or Europe? And it's like, that's a real challenge. Yeah, we're currently kind of in a situation where the games, the, the consumers don't know where the games are no. created or who even made these games. No, which is, the, which is the other side of the coin. It's like, yeah. but ultimately, do gamers really care where the game's from? I'd say, no, they don't. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I mean, I would say the majority of people in the U.S. who play Angry Birds have no idea it's from here. Mm -hmm. They don't. They just have no clue. Any more questions there? Yes, thank you for the great lecture. It was really inspiring. Thank you. Nice to, nice to listen to. But <clears throat> what would you say that how much does the, the modern day that you can touch patch, patch, patch games a lot affect this kind of work? Like, uh, if game gets published and it gets a shit storm and then they fix it is it like fine or it does that shit storm affect them a lot it depends on the smell thickness and you know general qualities of the shit um, honestly I know it's a crappy answer terrible pun <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> um, I couldn't resist um, honestly it depends on what the issue is um, you know so like that the Age of Empires example like with Korea that one would be super easy to do because I mean that was pretty much very like laser focused on the Korean market. I don't think a lot of other people at the time knew it happened at all. Um, you know, of course that was pre-social media. So nowadays, it'd be, hey, look what happened. Um, but I, I think that kind of thing's a little bit easier to fix. Um, you know, if it becomes just this massive, massive shitstorm that gets major global news, like, oh, look what happened here, and um, it can be a lot harder. You know, no, no amount of patching is going to fix it. Um, but it depends. You know, of course, then it gets to the other side of the coin where the controversy becomes the selling point. As we've often seen in games, I mean, GTA has made fortunes over being like the controversial game, you know. Um, whereas I don't really think it's that controversial. It's just yet another M-rated game. It's no different from another Martin Scorsese movie with F-bombs every other few seconds and gunshots and everything. But, you know, that's film, that's game. But, um, I, I, you know, a lot of it just depends on what happens. I mean, if it's, if it's, if it's something that, if it's like a cultural issue that pisses somebody off really bad, um, and pisses off a specific market, if you can patch it and fix it, sometimes that's fine. It's like we had an issue with, um, with flight sim in Greece, for example, where the, um, the air traffic control boundaries in the game were drawn in such a way by mistake so that the island of Rhodes was cut in half by the air traffic control boundary between Greece and Turkey. So when you were flying your plane, towards Turkey over the island of Rhodes, which is entirely Greek, halfway over the island it says you're now entering Turkish airspace. And so the Greek government got super pissed off about that, you know, because it's like, hey, you just gave half of our island to Turkey. That's a simple patch, okay? I mean, yeah, the government was pissed off. We said, look, it's just a, it's a glitch, technical problem. We'll fix it, we fixed it, here's the patch, boom, it's done. Okay, fine, move on, no problems. Um, so that's easy. That's an easy fix. But if it's something more systemic, um, it, it's just, it just depends. It depends how deep the issue goes and how much of a storm it created. So, I think uh, if you have more questions, we can uh, kind of uh, give Kate to you on the coffee uh, break or coffee uh, time. But I have uh, one final question. Okay. Um, there's a lot of examples what to kind of not to do mm -hmm. <laughs> or how to fix them, but every single game is obviously unique. Yes. So how do you as a developer kind of uh, start? How do you start doing this? Do you, how do you contact the people that would know how to mm -hmm. kind of look at your game? Right. Or how do you do the research yourself? Okay, great question. So basically what you should do, I mean, first and foremost, you always have to just make the game you want to make. Okay, just have your creative vision. It's like, I want to make this kind of game. It takes place in this kind of culture. Whatever it is you're doing, just kind of, you have to have that as your basis for creating. And, so you, that, and don't deviate from it unless you decide you have a really good reason to deviate from it. Like, well, I don't want to do it that way anymore. Or I'm going to make a different type of game or whatever. Um, 
you know, so you have, because you have to have that kind of keel along which the whole project is going to depend as you move forward. Um, things you have to start thinking about, though, is like you can think about target markets. You say, okay, well, I am interested in East Asia. I would like the game to sell in Japan, Korea, and China. Okay, well, right there, you have, you've got it, you've already narrowed three three very different markets where you have to start thinking about content for those three markets. So you can start thinking about things like look at other Japanese games that might be similar to what you're creating, um, or even films, like I said, the precedent issues. Because so kind of go out there and see what have other people done, especially games created in that market. That's what's most important. What have they done to, that's made those games successful for that type of gameplay? And is there something there you can learn from it? And by learning, I mean learn, not copy. <laughs> Don't just emulate exactly what they did, but there might be something there that you could leverage in your own way and kind of use, whether it's a core mechanic of the game, whether it's a certain design element, design style, like we know the design style of kind of the manga anime style is massively popular across all of Asia. So that's where you'll see a lot of Japanese or games that want to focus on East Asia, Japan, Korea, China, they will adopt sort of that anime style of drawing, which is you can find everywhere. Um, so you might want to say, okay, well, I want to make my game I want to kind of appeal to that style and yet then you have to be careful because if you do then your game suddenly becomes like every other game that's in the Asian market and so how do you how do you maintain some kind of uniqueness in there and so you have to keep weighing that but again you have to always keep going back to your creative vision is this really what I want to do and at one point it's like is, is this really serving the creative vision that I've come up with or am I just basically bending over backwards just so I can get more Japanese players or Chinese players or whoever and that's where you have to make that decision is that what I'm what am I really trying to do um, and different developers have different goals I mean some will basically just say that they say I really want to get more players of my games in East Asia because what I really want is I want them to play the next game I'm working on so I've at least got to get some kind of adoption so people know that I I'm, have a presence and they can like my games so then when I release my next game in two years then I might already have some fans in those locales so again that's like market long-term market strategy versus what you're doing on that particular game so there's a lot of different things to think about. Yeah, so basically it is work. Yes, <laughs> yeah. it is. It's a job. Yeah. Thank you, Kate, for the lecture. Thank you.